morning, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the Inter-American Development Bank, we would like to now give you a warm uh, welcome to the first uh, te virtual technical dialogue on trafficking in persons in Latin America and the Caribbean. We will have Mauricio Claver Carone, president of the IDB and the executive director of the UN against uh, drugs and crime, nada why. The event will be in Spanish, English, and Portuguese, and we will have simultaneous interpretation in all three languages. Icon at the bottom of your screen and select the language. Adelante, Presidente Claver Carone. Hola, ¿qué tal? Muchísimas gracias. Good morning, and thank you very much. Uh, welcome to everyone. Director, estimadas autoridades participantes de los paneles de discusión, esteemed panelists, ladies and gentlemen. So the issue that we're going to be discussing today affects all of the nations around the world, without exception. The crime of trafficking in persons affects the dignity, the freedom of more than 40 million people around the world. Women, girls, men, boys suffer in silence with this spiral of intimidation, abuse, violence, and degradation. And if that weren't enough, the COVID pandemic has also worsened the situation. The sexual exploitation in trafficking in persons is the most known crime, but you also have forced labor, uh, child pornography, domestic violence, as well as forced recruitment is uh, all a series of crimes from uh, trafficking in persons. So this increase that we've seen is even more pronounced in Latin America and the Caribbean, where most of the victims are women and children. So given the magnitude and the seriousness of this crime, nations and organizations like the IDB have put this in the center of their focus. 25 years anniversary has already been uh, celebrated in terms of the signing of the Palermo Agreement to address trafficking in persons. Also, some of the sustainable development goals adopted in 2015 also focused on this. In 2019, the OAS member states agreed on specific principles in order to protect and guarantee the human rights of all, including victims of trafficking in persons, but we still have a long way to go. One of the major challenges to combat this terrible crime is also attacking the profits from trafficking in persons. In fact, it is the third most lucrative illicit business in terms of um, organized crime after drug trafficking and falsification and counterfeiting. About $50 billion are generated, of which 12 billion are generated in Latin America and the Caribbean. Two thirds are related to sexual exploitation. So it's only through these comprehensive and coordinated approaches will that would include various and diverse sectors and actors. Only this way we can have meaningful and permanent change. So what are some of the key focuses? Well, first of all, it's essential to reinforce the capabilities in the area of justice and security in order to prosecute those guilty in trafficking in persons. That requires working together with uh, immigration, the employment, and uh, other agencies so that they are best uh, placed in order to detect cases of forced labor in their jurisdictions. The protection and the follow-up of victims during legal procedures is also essential, as well as providing services to provide uh, continuous uh, support. These need to be even more personalized and intense when those most vulnerable victims, such as children, boys, girls, migrants, the LGBTQ, as well as indigenous communities and those suffering from um, handicaps and disabilities. It is also important that we have a strategic communication policy in order to raise a greater awareness among the citizens, since this is a shared responsibility and we'll have much more of an impact if we look at it that way. These networks of trafficking persons use internet in order to recruit, recruit their victims, especially minors, in order to get uh, better in contact with our uh, clients. So 
this is something that we've seen throughout the world that um, op operate with a low probability of detection and high levels of impunity. That's why cyber crimes agencies and uh, laboratories need to work comprehensively in order to combat this scourge. Also, these networks involved in trafficking and persons work with other criminal enterprises, including drugs, as well as counterfeiting and money laundering organizations. We need to understand that uh, transnational nature. For each case detected, there are at least 20 that have not been detected. So we need to have quality information that is timely and is crucial. The pandemic has increased the exposure to our very vulnerable populations, and they have put to the test the capacities and resources of our institutions to combat it. Today, more than ever, we need to respond to this crime. At the IDB, we are fully committed to be a part of the solution. We have a multi-sector framework in order to provide technical advice and financial assistance to the countries in the region in order to combat trafficking in persons using a comprehensive approach, but we cannot or nor should we do it alone. That's why today we have the direct executive director of the UN uh, on crime and drugs. It is a pleasure to have her. So the uh, UNODC is a long-term partner and a leader globally in this area. So the report, the global report, is a reference in terms of statistics. So with UNODC, we are joining in efforts to develop our first regional report on capacities to respond in the justice system here in Latin America and the Caribbean. So today we have launched this series of technical dialogues where we will have diverse sectors from the bank that are involved in this. We will have government representatives, people from NGOs, professional organizations, the private sector, where we will discuss the progress as well as opportunities and challenges in dealing with this crime. So today is the first of five dialogues that will delve into this issue from diverse perspectives. And now to conclude, I'd once again like to thank Director Wadi and all of the panelists and speakers for their participation. Those attendees that include government representatives from many countries, we thank you, as well as the organizers from the team here at the IDB, thank you for all your efforts in this very important undertaking. So our efforts against this uh, heinous crime is an imperative. We want to make sure that human beings are no longer treated like commodities. So thank you very much and welcome to all of you. Thank you, President. Welcome, Mrs. Gada Wali, Executive Director of the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime, co-host of this event, who will provide welcome remarks. Ms. Wali, the floor is yours. Thank you. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for inviting me to open this dialogue on responses to trafficking in persons in Latin America and the Caribbean. I welcome the Inter-American Development Bank's focus on this topic as part of its mission to advance development in the region and improve lives. The bank has been a steadfast partner of the UN Office on Drugs and Crime, supporting our alternative development work, our research on crime in the region, and our global reports on trafficking in persons and smuggling of migrants. We are publishing the latest edition of our global report on trafficking in persons in January. The report contains alarming data on Latin America and the Caribbean. Women and girls account for 79% of all detected victims in Central America and the Caribbean, and for 74% of all detected victims in South America. This is well above the global average of 65%. The majority are trafficked for sexual exploitation, and these numbers are on the increase. In Central America and the Caribbean, 40% of detected victims are girls, one of the highest shares of girls among detected victims recorded worldwide. Governments need to urgently scale up effective action against this crime to ensure that victims are protected and have access to justice, while traffickers are prosecuted and convicted. 2020 is a milestone year in the global fight against human trafficking, as we mark the 20th anniversary of the UN Convention Against Transnational Organized Crime. 
All states in Latin America and the Caribbean are parties to the convention and its anti-trafficking protocol. And most have introduced a specific trafficking offense in their legislation, allowing for more victims to be detected and more perpetrators to be held accountable. In order to make full use of the tools provided by these key legal instruments, we need coordinated responses at the regional level. The latest UNODC research shows that 97% of victims detected in South America and 91% of those detected in Central America and the Caribbean are trafficked from countries of the same sub-region. As the guardian of the Convention Against Transnational Organized Crime and its protocols, UNODC is proud to be a strategic partner for countries in Latin America and the Caribbean in strengthening national and regional action, working through our Vienna headquarters and our field offices in 10 countries. Since 2018, under our global program against trafficking in persons, we have provided technical assistance to 18 countries in the region. We have trained hundreds of law enforcement officers, prosecutors, and judges. We have helped develop national legal frameworks and policies against trafficking in Brazil and Colombia, consulted on the revision of legislation in Peru and Bolivia, and we are currently providing legislative assistance in the Dominican Republic. To foster coordinated action in the region, our office has facilitated the creation of joint investigation teams and partnered with the Ibero-American Network of Specialized Prosecutors in Trafficking in Persons and Smuggling of Migrants. We also worked under the Track 4 TIP project to counter trafficking affecting migrants in the region under the leadership of Interpol. We have contributed to two major transnational anti-migrant smuggling operations while involved more than 20 countries in Latin America and Asia, leading to the rescue of dozens of trafficking victims. UNODC also strives to improve coordination of anti-trafficking efforts within the UN system. As the permanent coordinator of the Interagency Coordination Group Against Trafficking in Persons and a core member of the UN Network on Migrants, we manage the only UN Trust Fund with a focus on women and girl victims of human trafficking, which provides direct aid to non-governmental organizations. Under its third and fourth grant cycles, the Trust Fund has supported NGOs in Bolivia, Colombia, Ecuador, and the Dominican Republic, specializing in critical assistance to victims. Such assistance is even more important now as the COVID crisis and recent natural disasters such as hurricanes Eta and Iota have disrupted services to victims. Trafficking victims find themselves in a particularly dire situation in the pandemic as they often lack access to healthcare and social protection and intensified support is urgently needed. Ladies and gentlemen, the long-term impact of the current crisis on human trafficking is not yet clear but UNODC analysis indicates that rising poverty and unemployment will only increase trafficking vulnerabilities. At this crucial time, we need governments to scale up responses, work together and partner with international organizations, financial institutions, civil society, and the private sector to effectively prevent and counter trafficking, putting victims at the center of all our efforts. This inclusive, multi-stakeholder approach is integral to UNODC's new corporate strategy for the next five years and to our upcoming strategy for Latin America and the Caribbean due next year. We look forward to working with all of you within this framework. We also hope to further our partnership with the Inter-American Development Bank to support the region in recovering better from the COVID crisis with safer and fairer societies and dignity and justice for all. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Wally. It is an honor to have UNODC, a long-standing partner for the IDB, participating in this event. Now I offer the floor to Mr. Sarmiento, who is a uh, senior specialist from the Center for Knowledge and Learning, Adela. Well, good morning, and thank you very much uh, to be here during this official uh, launch of our dialogue. I know we have 184 participants connected and we're very thankful for your uh, participation. I know that you're all very concerned about this. So for all of our participants, we ask that you use a hashtag uh, trafficking in persons for asking questions. So we need strong organizations in order to address human 
and um, trafficking in person. We'd like to also welcome Ms. Jimenez, who works at the IDB in uh, assistance to communities. So you're going to now take the floor. Go ahead, Lea. Thank you, Adela. And thank you for being with us during this initial dialogue as we officially launch this series of dialogues dealing with trafficking in persons in Latin America and the Caribbean. Special greetings to our panelists and to all of you who are connecting from various countries around the world. Special greetings to our direct executive director at the uh, bank and special thanks to uh, Elio Pedrosa, Angel Castillo, as well as Laura Uspina, who have supported us in developing this uh, series of dialogues. Also special thanks to the uh, UNODC and in particular, uh, Perez working in the area on uh, the trafficking in persons in Latin America and the Caribbean who have been instrumental. I also like to convey greetings to all our colleagues at the IDB, the D Office of uh, Gender Diversity, Ms. Bosch offer, from the Office of um, Labor, as well as the Office of Migrations and Elena Barrio, who is a senior specialist in knowledge and learning. So with uh, the president of the IDB, we know that um, trafficking in persons is something that operates in the shadows and affects millions of people. And it really reflects a serious, a serious uh, attack on the human rights of uh, men, women, boys, girls throughout the world. Our region is not, uh, is not unfamiliar with this uh, scourge. And we have seen an increase in the number of cases detected and also in the number of prosecutions. Although this increase might be a reflection of an increase in the capacities and resources of the organizations to detect, prosecute, identify these cases, it could also reflect an increase in the number of cases. And it is precisely this challenge to get a better knowledge and understanding of this reflects the magnitude of the challenge where we need to step up our efforts. The Office of um, the Innovation of uh, Serving Citizens and Citizen Security reflects an increase in capabilities, institutional capabilities to address the needs of all of our citizens so that we are more effective and innovative to contribute to improve their quality of life and living standards. And today's discussion is going to allow us to delve even further in looking at the need to strengthen security and justice organizations and institutions to combat this scourge. The dialogue also looks at institutional strengthening as a back the backbone and really the cornerstone of public policies. It is a also as we look at trafficking in persons from the perspective of the Office of Justice and Security at the IDB that has worked following a comprehensive approach that includes prevention of violence, effectiveness and professionalization of law enforcement agencies, also effective access to um, equal justice and reinsertion of uh, the um, justice and uh, penal system, working with law enforcement, uh, prosecutors, and also third parties. And these are the institutions that have the responsibility for preventing, also preventing, protecting, and prosecuting these crimes. And for this effort, it is key that we have precise information regarding the issues to also strengthen the specialized organizations working in law enforcement to have the necessary procedures in order to follow up and prosecute cases, have specialized and continuous training programs following this up in order to provide and protect our victims. Also management of information, having that infrastructure in place, working in countries and the list goes on. Of course, the efforts of these institutions do not uh, are not undertaken isolated from one another. This requires continuous, uh, continuous cooperation 
between those organizations working with immigration, law enforcement, customs, and also organizations dealing with uh, gender issues. So the trafficking in persons needs to have uh, coordinated and resilient and effective efforts. We need to look at the context in terms of trafficking in persons. And this panel is going to look at the capabilities of the security and justice organizations and their efforts against this crime, following a comprehensive model of uh, prevention, protection, and prosecution, the three Ps. And so we will share some of the key progress and success stories of countries around the region. We will also be able to identify some of the key challenges, especially in the face of the COVID-19 pandemic. This has put to the test the capabilities of our organizations. We'll also seek recommendations aimed at reducing vulnerabilities in the region. I'm very pleased with the discussions that we, and I look forward to the discussions that we'll have as countries share their, their um, findings and their success stories, and also look at some of the key intersectoral efforts. That will also be focused during the next uh, panel discussion. So the private sector, the role of communications, as well as uh, victims, uh, assistance organizations, access to technology, there are many ways that these can contribute significantly to our discussions with the coordinated integrated efforts that address the challenges in each sector. This way we can improve our tools to combat crime and also just to reflect the uh, Blue Cross uh, measures, we reiterate and affirm that human beings are not for sale. So without further ado, I'd like to give the floor to uh, Ms. Alvarado, and we will begin the uh, session. Thank you. Thank you, Leah. And uh, I'm very pleased to warmly welcome our distinguished guests and participants, Marvin Deni from, Demi from uh, the Bahamas, and also Claudio Barreo who is a Minister, Secretary of Justice from Brazil, and John Richman, for Ambassador from the Office of Monitoring and Combating Trafficking in Persons from the U.S. State Department, and Ilias Chaxis, who is Director of the Office for Detection of uh, Trafficking in Persons and Illegal Immigration from the UN Office Against uh, Crime and Drugs. And we also have uh, the Office of Preventing and uh, Punishing Trafficking in Persons. Rosa Correa, Executive Secretary of the in Interagency Organization Against uh, Sexual Exploitation and uh, Trafficking in Persons from Honduras. Camila Rubia from the Chief, the chief of the Department on uh, Organized Crime from the Ministry of Justice in Chile. So thank I thank all of our distinguished panelists who have accepted this invitation from the bank to discuss this very crucial issue affecting Latin America and the Caribbean. So the objective of this panel is to delve further into the ca institutional capabilities already identified by Lea in the area of citizen security and justice to deal with the trafficking in persons from a comprehensive perspective, as we've already reiterated. And I'm referring to, in this case, the paradigm of protecting, uh, preventing, and prosecuting these crimes, not just in the area of justice, security and justice, but also the need to coordinate with other sectors in order to get the most sustainable and effective responses. This panel is going to analyze the capacities the problems and will also inform us about progress made in Latin America and the Caribbean in this area. I would like to invite the members of the panel to spend a good portion of our time to talk about solution, the best practices and the key areas regarding this theme, because that is how we will be able to make a difference without Further ado, let us start. Um, Ambassador, 
20 years ago, the Palermo Protocol was adopted and the State Department started producing the Trafficking in Persons Report known as TIP. So uh, let me start by asking you, how have uh, Latin American the Caribbean institutional capacities and efforts to combat TIPS evolved in the last 20 years? I will also, I will add also to, I, I will appreciate also if you could briefly tell us about the work of the office to monitor and combat uh, trafficking in persons uh, at the State Department uh, that you lead uh, with regards to Latin America. Ambassador Richman, thank you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, it's an honor to be a part of this panel today. I'm so grateful for the um, International Development Bank for organizing this. Um, as we think about um, the last 20 years, I think there's several things worth noting. 20 years ago, there was not a UN protocol on trafficking in persons. Um, and now today, um, over 170 countries have acceded to it and every single country in the Western hemisphere is now a party to that. And I'm so grateful for our colleagues at UNODC for their leadership in shepherding and guarding that protocol and making it, it effective around the world. Um, you know, 20 years ago, no country really had a comprehensive law regarding how modern traffickers are operating. And now we have over 150 countries that have that. We've seen remarkable progress in the last 20 years, particularly around legal frameworks. More and more countries have um, interministerial coordinating mechanisms and bodies. We've seen um, a rise in protocols around standard operating procedures for victim identification, national referral mechanisms. We're seeing government build systems that are helpful and effective. The question before us now, as we look into the next 20 years is, are we going to develop delivery systems for, um, for these protections? How do we actually take the, the laws on paper the words that are printed on parchment and actually make them a reality for the victims around the world. And I think that is our grand task and why I'm so thankful that you're hosting this dialogue um, about specific solutions, about how we can get better at that. But I think in the last 20 years, we've seen remarkable progress. Uh, we've embraced the idea of victim-centered and trauma-informed approaches. We've learned to, to really invite and develop survivor leadership in this space. We've made notable progress, but I, I think it is, um, it's worth pausing, even as we celebrate the progress to recognize that we have so far to go. You know, right now, uh, we had a record high number of victims identified last year by governments all around the world. Um, and yet, if you compare it to the ILO's estimate of the number of victims, 24.9 million forced labor and sex trafficking victims around the world, governments are identifying less than four tenths of 1% of the victims that are estimated to exist in the world. We're doing a terrible job. We have got to improve. We've got to push forward. And when you think about perpetrator accountability, we've seen a 38% drop in uh, prosecutions of traffickers over the last five years all around the globe. It's a consistent pattern. It's deeply concerning. Right now, I think traffickers are operating with impunity. And it's the responsibility of policymakers and governments to step in and actually reverse these trends. We need to identify more victims, make sure everyone who's a victim of trafficking gets the services they need. And we need to hold traffickers accountable. And our efforts, if they do not achieve those ends, may be, in the words of one survivor I met with, just futile. I think they, they desire our good intentions, they desire our, our, our ability to work in this space, but what they really want is change to come. They want the pain to stop. And that's why this movement is so important and why our work is so meaningful. You asked about uh, the Trafficking in Persons Office at the United States State Department. It's such a privilege to get to serve um, in this office. Uh, and our focus is just these ideas. It's pushing in with governments around the world and leading in our bilateral relationships as well as in the multilateral space about this important issue, 
this intersection of human rights uh, and criminal law, thinking about how do we actually work with governments around the world to assist them, to serve them um, in making a difference in this work. We do that through our engagement, through our trafficking in persons report, um, but we also do it through our foreign assistance. We do it through uh, the aid and development that we give countries as we try to support them and support civil society organizations who are leading in this fight. There is a lot to be thankful for as we celebrate the 20th anniversary of Palermo. And there is a lot that we need to get better at. And I think holding both of those, that dynamic tension um, is important. Both are true, both are real at the same time. And I'm just grateful uh, for everyone who's joining today, showing their commitment to this important cause of freedom. Thank you very much, Ambassador, for your insights and very positive thoughts. Let me now turn to, to the Caribbean. Uh, Minister uh, Dames, we know that the Bahamas is actively combating tips. Uh, please tell us about the main achievements in this respect and specifically about your well-known communication and awareness campaign to combat tips. Thank you so much. Before I make my comments, I bring warm greetings and salutations from the government and the people of the Bahamas and to express my gratitude to the organizers for arranging um, a timely and very important uh, dialogue series on trafficking in persons in the region. And so kudos to all involved. The Bahamas' presence during this virtual platform on human trafficking signifies our understanding of the issues regarding human trafficking. We are fully cognizant that we are all inextricably bound to the region and hemisphere considered, considering the transnational nature of trafficking. As a hemispheric partner, the Bahamas will continue to support platforms such as this while strengthening our institutions and national anti-trafficking strategies. We in the Bahamas continue to enhance our four-pronged approach to strengthen institutions and their initiatives. Our first-pronged approach is contemporary legislation. The Parliament of the Bahamas passed in 2008 the Trafficking in Person Prevention and Suppression Act. The legislation was also amended in 2017 to encompass organized entities engaged in trafficking. Understanding that the human trafficking is, is complex with many nuances, the legislative component forms the basis for confronting the seriousness of, of the crime. To complement the same are several other frameworks which support our laws to address human trafficking. These include guidelines for the prevention, suppression, and punishment of trafficking in persons. Two, the National Anti-Trafficking in Persons Strategy, 2019 to 2023. Three, the Bahamas Trafficking in Persons Response Standard Operating Procedures, and four, guidelines to provide assistance to victims of trafficking in persons and their accompanying children. Individually and collectively, the legislation guidelines and policies provides comprehensive and robust frameworks in the fight against trafficking in persons. This intricate interplay of elements allow for broad views to address the very ways in which individuals are exploited, yet specific enough to address the often convoluted processes of trafficking. Our second uh, prong approach is training and awareness campaigns is a critical component in ending human trafficking. The purpose of training is to increase awareness and educate persons on the indicators of human trafficking. 
The ultimate goal is to identify victims so that they can be rescued and begin healing while bringing their perpetrators to justice. Since 2018, the Trafficking in Person Secretariat in the Bahamas constitute the nucleus through which all trafficking in persons initiatives inclusive of one, public awareness and training, two, the, for, the, for, the, forgo, the forging of national and international partnerships, three, care and protection of victims, and four, the investigation and prosecutions of traffickers emanate. We are proud to highlight the many that my ministry and government also establish a national hotline which operates on a 24 hour basis. Continuous collaboration and training platforms for law enforcement officials, medical personnel, educators, non-government organizations, and those employed in the judicial sector are key. Recently, the Bahamas participated in a virtual platform designed specific, specifically for the judicial sector. These persons serve to, one, advance the mandate on the eradication of trafficking, two, are better able to counter human trafficking, and three, propose legislation in alignment with international standards. Our third prong approach would be victims protection and recovery services is important as we remain fully committed to protecting and assisting all victims of trafficking while being cognizant of their human rights. Working with both government and non-government agencies through our Trafficking in Persons Task Force, we facilitate one, referrals for housing and meals assistance, two, physical and psychological assessments, three, transportation, four, repatriations if necessary, and five, training and skills acquisition for employment. This individual protocol is activated with every victim and services are easily accessed. We fully understand that the needs of all victims are different and we aim to facilitate these for the individual care and support. Our fourth, the successful prosecution and conviction of human traffickers. The government of the Commonwealth of the Bahamas continues to aggressively pursue such individuals and their networks. I will admit that much work remains in this component. And we have committed to strengthening our institutions and the people within, inclusive, inclusive of law enforcement, judicial health care, and social services personnel. This means that all parties will be knowledgeable and have the capacity to respond accordingly. To undergird the aforementioned prongs, the government of the Bahamas has made trafficking in persons a priority by adding it as a safety concern in the office of the prime minister's delivery unit. This means that the nuances surrounding trafficking are a top priority at the highest level of government. Additionally, consultative leadership and partnership with critical ministries such as education, health, and transportation are facilitated for effective networking, the sharing of best practices and strengthened capacity within their prescribed focus areas to improve outcomes for victims of trafficking. I thank you. Thank you very much, Minister, and, and congratulations uh, for making this topic uh, a top a priority of, of, of the government of the Bahamas. Thank you very much. Ahora nos vamos, eh, al cono Sur. Thomas, we will now go to the Southern Cone, Brazil, Secretary 
Claudio Panoelio, please tell us about the situation in Brazil, especially with regard to information assistance to victims and your initiatives because Brazil has made important progress in the recent years. Sir, you have the floor. Good morning, everyone. In Brazil, we are a very large country, and of course, this territory also is reflected on this topic. It is very hard for Brazilians to follow the traffickers' movements, but in spite of all of these practical difficulties, in these past 20 years, our country has been making efforts to generate uh, legal frameworks for this fight. So as of 2004, Brazil included in its legislation the Palermo Protocol, thus opening a new trajectory to fight this crime in 2006. We've also had the opportunity to approve our own national policy to fight trafficking in persons. And in the years that followed, we've also approved other guidelines and laws in this area. The very first one that was implemented from 2008 to 2010 focused its attentions in repressing this crime through the presentation of legislative propositions in such a way as to make changes and amendments in our legislation. After that, between 2013 and 16, a second national plan was implemented. And here, I believe it's worthwhile to mention two aspects. First of all, the fact that these three years that separate out the end of the first national plan and the beginning of the second plan, they were essential for the Brazilian state for what we call monitoring, in other words, evaluating the results of actions that were implemented during the first plan. And what we could find through these assessments was that it was important to also include social society to the public policies in this area. Thus, the, for the second plan, what it does is to include civil society organizations as players working with us against this crime. And in 2016, at the end of the second plan, Brazil will also promote an important change in its penal code, incorporating types that make our legislation compatible with the Palermo Protocol, because we do understand that this crime also includes forced labor, sexual exploitation, and organ removal, among other activities. And also in 2016, we have evolved towards a union of forces, because we understand that the Brazilian state is not alone in this fight, and we needed to get closer to the law enforcement officers in other states in, in such a way as to be successful in the implementation of our program. So through this joint effort, we were able to advance and go on to the third national plan that started in 2018. Again, that two year period between the second and the third plan was a monitoring and assessment period, which allowed us to define the actions to be implemented for the following years. So here we're talking about from 2018 to 2022. And within this third plan, the main action that we can highlight is that the Brazilian state is committed not only to repress, crime, but also protecting and assisting 
and its victims, especially women and children. So in 2019, Brazil has had the opportunity to carry out a very large police uh, uh, operation that was called Turquoise Operation. And because of its very successful results, it was recognized worldwide and gave the country the prerogative to advance even further in this topic, promoting new actions. Also, sometimes exporting this model to its partners. At this point in time, we are in the middle of our third national plan. And what we saw was that our major challenge today is to give capillarity to our network. So because of this, our uh, justice uh, department from the Justice and Security Ministry in Brazil has been trying to coordinate actions with states and cities so that our networks will reach the different regions in our country. And from those regions, through a decentralizing policy, we really wish to fight this crime. So this has been our contribution in these past 20 years. Thank you so much. This is a very important lesson, not only the coordination amongst institutions, which is of key importance, but also the coordination at the different levels of government in order to have effective uh, measures. We will now go to the southern cone, Chile. Chile has always been uh, an example, especially with regard to coordination. They have a national action plan against the traffic in persons, which activates several uh, institutions. Camila, please tell us about your work and your institution that is working in Chile since 2008 against traffic in person. And please tell us, how does the public service help victims and how do you interact with organizations? Thank you so much for the invitation. In the Ministry of Interior, we are fighting against traffic in persons and since 2018 we created an intersectoral coordination mechanism and we have obtained results at different levels where first success was the identification of this crime and so it was possible to include it in the investigation and in the courts. And also we generated a mechanism that allows us to think about prevention and prosecution and also the protection of the victims. Within this context, you were pointing out that we created this action plan which articulates the public participation and the cooperation with civil society organizations that are specialized in this area. Our plan has been implemented seven years ago, and we have started to work on prevention. We believe that prevention is one of the aspects that was perhaps a little bit lagging behind, but we have launched several specialization campaigns of public servants so as to increase the capacity of detection of victims. Our action plan also has helped us to specialize the prosecution and we have obtained that our police create a specialized brigade against the traffic in humans in 2012. And this plan also try to generate mechanisms of international cooperation and internal coordination. In that sense, one of the great products we are very proud of in our action plan is the protocol for attention to victims. This protocol 
involves several services, um, housing, health assistance, work, migration, and sometimes the return or repatriation of the victims. This protocol is based on the public uh, offerings, but is also trying to coordinate this with civil society organizations and international organizations. Currently, we have more than 20 institutions which are both public and private in the process, and we are have been working on this process. As I said, we have been implementing this plan for the past seven years, and although we think that there are still several challenges, we have been able to make progress and we have been able to obtain recognition. The United States, for instance, has recognized the effort made by the government of Chile according to our protocol. Thank you. Thank you so much, Camila. And once again, I congratulate you for this action plan and for the intersectoral bureau. We will continue trying to find out about it. Um, from the point of view of UNODC, which is who is a, a key player in the adoption of the Palermo Protocol 20 years ago and responsible for the global report on trafficking in persons, what has been the main achievements of the region during these 20 years? And what are the key insights and the most uh, of the most recent global report in trafficking in persons report uh, uh, regard Latin America and the Caribbean? Thank you so much. And thank you so much for inviting us today. Um, the uh, the um, as Ambassador Richmond mentioned, and also it was mentioned by our executive director, Ms. Valley, uh, the, uh, the protocol is only 20 years old. And as 20 years old is a relatively young instrument. So the high number of, uh, of ratifications that come also from Latin America countries is one of the biggest achievements of the region, that all countries in the Western Hemisphere basically are parties of the protocol. And I wanna draw your attention here because the protocol now has 178 um, state parties. The United Nations has 193 member states. That means basically almost everyone in the United Nations is a member, has signed off to the protocol. That's extremely important and for a number of reasons. First, because all these countries agree to criminalize uh, trafficking in persons in the same manner. Second, because this is the instrument, actually the first instrument, international instrument that had uh, victim protection provisions. And third, because it has quite strong international cooperation provisions. So being part of the, of the protocol and being a state part of the protocol is a significant achievement. All the Latin American countries are parties to the, to the protocol and uh, all of them have criminal laws uh, criminalizing trafficking persons. Uh, we see also in the region um, an, increase, it, 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 an, an increasing number of identified uh, victims of trafficking persons still well below the, uh, the actual numbers that we think are out there. And, but still, this is, significant, uh, this is significant development. Our new report is coming out at the beginning of next year, in January 2021, and we'll be looking at the last, at the recent uh, two years. Um, the report also provides, if you want, um, uh, um, a, 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 a stock taking of, of the global efforts to fight trafficking in persons. One of the issues that I wanted to raise here is also the fact that trafficking in persons is agreed upon. It's, it's a crime that everybody agrees upon needs to be uh, addressed. So there's no disagreement within the United Nations about the need to, uh, to deal with trafficking in persons. The question is how best to deal with it and what needs to be done to further the implementation of the protocol. And here we have a couple of, uh, of, uh, of areas where we think member states can improve. One is the investigations and the prosecution. We think that far below uh, the actual number, the, the numbers of, of investigations and prosecutions are far below the actual trafficking cases happening out there. We feel also that prosecutors and judges in general, and investigators and prosecutors in general, uh, do not sometimes understand well the crime. So sometimes the traffickers get away with, with, with lesser sentences 
or with with uh, um, uh, with crimes that they are far below the threshold of trafficking persons. The, at the same time, we think there needs to be much more that needs to be done uh, to identify victims of trafficking persons. There's a lot of efforts that have already taken place, but there's a lot that needs to be done. Women and girls and children as well are among those that are the most vulnerable. As Ms. Valley mentioned, uh, Latin America has the highest number of women and girl victims of trafficking in persons, and it also has the highest number of children victims of trafficking in persons. And here with children also, we see types of trafficking that are, are particular, like for example, forced begging. We also see uh, um, uh, uh, that they used to, 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 um, uh, to, 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 to do criminal activities on behalf of the traffickers. Uh, and so on. So we see very specific, and, and of course, especially during the COVID uh, period that we're, we, we're going through, we see also quite uh, an increase in online sexual exploitation of children. So all of these things are the issues that we are, we are concerned of. We also um, believe that closer international cooperation would help further the implementation of the protocol and the national efforts to address trafficking persons. We know that there's a lot of efforts done in Latin America, uh, but we think that can be even closer, uh, maybe closer cooperation, maybe at the sub-regional level, maybe between uh, certain parts of the, uh, of, the, uh, of, of the Western Hemisphere. And that's where we think we can be helpful. Uh, we work very closely with the uh, prosecutors uh, network of uh, the Ibero-American Association of Prosecutors that is dealing with trafficking uh, and smuggling, RETROM. Uh, we're working quite close with them. We help them also integrate aspects of smuggling on, on the work plan. And uh, we will, we're also working with them on, on a number of operational issues. We also um, think that there's a lot of things that also us within the United Nations and also the other international organizations can do better to improve the support we offer to member states. Uh, we're already working close, in, uh, close with each other, but we can work much closer. We, now, Right now, for example, we're working uh, much closer than we used in the past with Interpol, with IOM with UNICEF, with UNHCR, and this is also quite uh, important for the member states so they can, they can receive the best of assistance from uh, the United Nations as a whole. What do we do as an office in this, in this case is that we basically are the hub within the UN on expertise. We provide assistance to countries, we train, we mentor, we facilitate international cooperation, and we help countries share uh, best experience and, and best practices. We have been doing quite uh, a lot of work in Latin America. We have 10 offices in the region. And uh, we're working, I'm, I'm speaking to you right now from Vienna, Austria, in Europe, but we're working a lot through our uh, country offices to, uh, to support the, uh, the Latin American countries. Thank you. No, thank you, Ilias, and, and, and thank you for highlighting all these positive, positive uh, trends and development, and also to remind us that we have a lot of work in front of us uh, regarding this, this, this topic. Uh, now I'd like to move on to Mexico. I'd like to ask uh, Felix about the key achievements over the last few years in the trafficking in persons. And maybe you could discuss some of the units that specialize in uh, the trafficking in persons and that the prosecutors have been involved in. We know that since 2012, we've seen an increase in uh, the uh, trafficking in person. And as a result today, you have special prosecutors distributed throughout the country. Felix, could you discuss the development of this with working with the various state jurisdictions? And how have you been able to implement these uh, specialized uh, training resources? Well, thank you very much. I'm Felix uh, Santana. I'd just like to uh, describe the various levels of uh, our focus in dealing with uh, trafficking in persons. We know that the executive level, working with the government, we have reinforced what we call the interagency committee for uh, tra trafficking in persons, where we have 17 various government entities that uh, allow for this holistic approach. So the committee, again, including these agencies, each one of the agencies, by the way, provide their input and resources in uh, combating this scourge. First, 
we look at this from the perspective of uh, serving victims of uh, human rights violations. And we also look at it from the perspective of law enforcement and criminal prosecution. So this interagency committee has as a support resource, a subcommittee where we have civil society experts from academia and also experts from NGOs that provide greater support and input in policy formulation. So within this subcommittee, we have six working groups that are distributing various tasks. The first working group is focused on uh, developing a national training program that focuses on training each one of the agencies from the uh, local jurisdiction level all the way to the federal jurisdictions. And also we look at um, the internal workings. We look at the internal rules and procedures. The second working group looks at the annual work plan. Over the next few days, we are going to be uh, looking at some of the activities forecast for 2021. So it's a working group for selection of experts, academics, and uh, representatives from civil society that will, uh, again, reinforce the work of the interagency committee. So this working group is based on developing a national system for to provide assistance to victims of uh, human trafficking so that we can develop information, we can develop statistics to support the uh, interagency plan of action. Then we have the next group that addresses the national program priorities. Over the next few days, we will be publishing the national plan addressing human trafficking for 2020 to 2024, closely aligned with the human rights priorities and tied back to Mexico's national development plan. So from this program, we have several objectives, offshoots that have to do with uh, reforms in rules and procedures. This is in accordance with the uh, Palermo Agreement and Convention. Also, this focuses on creating greater coordination between the local, state, and federal jurisdictions. Also looking reparations and reintegration, social reintegration to the victims of human trafficking. Then the next objective has to do with generating knowledge and content from the multi-sectoral, regional, local, national, and international levels. Sometimes we lose sight of the, the, the fact that trafficking in persons doesn't just affect a local jurisdiction, a family, or a community. Rather, it's part of a whole chain that is transnational in nature. And we need to follow that up. We need to follow that whole thread and not just look at it as one link in the chain or looking at it from an individual perspective. Then we look at it from the perspective of human rights and gender equality and gender rights. It's necessary to provide that whole holistic perspective. So in addition, we have established coordination between the committees and the within each one of the jurisdictions and states in Mexico. We have 62, uh, 32 entities, 32 states, each one with its own prosecutor's office. We have the prosecutors prosecuting criminal activities, but also looking at this. So there is a whole series of deficiencies in these models where we still need to shore up activities. We need to raise a greater awareness about um, these efforts because many officials still lack sufficient uh, information or resources to address the needs of victims. A victim of uh, trafficking, of um, trafficking in persons has a totally different perspective and it really requires sensitivity, a unique kind of sensitivity to address the needs of these victims. And that's why it is essential for us to be able to share. And we wanna just mention that in the middle of this pandemic this year, the number 
of recorded cases. went uh, to 1,820, and we see how from last year up until the present, we saw a reduction in certain modalities. Our legislation in Mexico has at least 11 different categories in prosecuting um, trafficking in person, which includes um, forced labor, slavery, and other um, it, it, illegal adoptions, forced marriages, organ, human organ trafficking, and the use of minors in criminal activities to benefit criminal, uh, criminal organizations. As was explained earlier, that we look at the use of minors for, to benefit criminal organizations. They are involved in high, as hired murderers and, and also in other crimes. And just to finish, the Constitution, well, since we've seen an 80%, we saw a, we saw a significant reduction in the um, forced labor area. We've seen an increase of 5% of those reported to 14 percent of cases reported this year. In terms of forced labor in 2019, we had about 8% and in 2020, it was 18% of all the crimes reported. In other words, it went up 10 points. So this scenario leads us to a situation where awareness raising, an under, better understanding of trafficking in persons is essential for the prosecutors. You have to delve much more in uh, getting a, a familiar familiarizing in the nature of this scourge so this is one of the key challenges that we're still facing in our country that is still pending we're still awaiting a new legislative reform so that we can have uh, more we, we can have uh, guidelines that are more aligned with the palermo protocol so the prosecutor's office right now is looking, well, first of all, it is autonomous in its modality. Up until two years ago, the attorney general's office in Mexico was under the federal government. But today, with this new, with this new status, we're no longer directly under the federal government. This is where we need to create new mechanisms to improve articulating our priorities. So once again, we need to look at uh, trafficking in persons as a serious human rights violation. That's why we have the interagency structure, but also looking at it from the law enforcement uh, perspective at the federal and state levels. So the government of Mexico has now stated that no human being should be subject to exploitation or the sale of people. Thank you very much, Secretary Santana. And we will closely follow up the projects and initiatives that you are um, conducting in Mexico. So now let's move on to Honduras. I would like to offer the floor to Rosa Correa. Rosa, could you discuss some of the key progress that's been made in your country? I know that among some of your achievements, you've included the creation of a special prosecutor uh, on human trafficking. Can you just describe how the this new special prosecutor's office is structured? Well, good morning and thank you very much for this opportunity to address you. Yes, we have been looking at over the last 20 years, a lot has elapsed in those two decades, although sometimes it seems like it's too little time to really step up efforts against such a cruel crime as trafficking in persons. But I believe that these forums motivate us to continue moving forward in these uh, initiatives and efforts. Yes, in Honduras, we have created starting in 2018, a specialized unit to combat trafficking in persons. This unit is a part of the machinery 
of the uh, the prosecutor's office, the attorney general, and it is a unit that has a technical specialized team of prosecutors and with the support of special investigators. We have the um, Federal uh, Criminal Investigative Unit. We also have the um, criminal Transnational Criminal Investigating Unit and uh, the Interpol uh, units. So this is followed up with uh, various operations undertaken by the Secretariat of Security and the Secretariat of Defense. So to have a technical and specialized unit, we have been able to conduct more effective uh, prosecutions of these cases. We've gone from zero sentences for this crime for many years. Starting in 2015, we saw a, a gradual increase in the number of prosecutions. And by 2019, we had 30, 38 people that were prosecuted and convicted for this crime. So as a result of the pandemic this year, the number of convictions has dropped, but we hope to um, re re resume the pace that we had seen over the last five years. So with this unit that is part of the uh, Central America unit of uh, Central American and Mexican law enforcement agencies and the prosecutors network, this allows us to coordinate efforts with the Ministry of Justice in these countries. And we've undertaken regional investigations and operations, joint investigations and prosecutions. In addition, in Honduras, we have a interagency committee that is responsible for leading and heading actions in the country in this area. So for us, we have seen throughout our experiences that having sound institutions is essential in order to uh, address this in a comprehensive manner. So the integration, and in fact, we have a multi-sectoral representation in this committee. We have representatives from various uh, departments. We have civil society organizations involved as well. And the uh, justice uh, authorities, all of their efforts have helped the nation move forward, make significant strides in dealing with these crimes. So we have seen that very clearly delineated in our responsibilities that has helped to respond institutional uh, re resources. So we have, again, reinforced institutional responses. We've coordinated efforts. We've increased cooperation. And we have introduced new capabilities in the area of the three Ps, prevention, uh, prosecution, and protection so that we can convict those guilty, again, protect our victims and prevent the occurrence of new crimes. We've had very positive results. In fact, over the last five years, we have seen more than 500 new victims in Honduras that were detected, identified. We've been able to rescue them and protect them. And they have now become a part of that uh, comprehensive uh, attention and reinsertion into civil society. We've also reinforced criminal investigations. Every year we see an increase in uh, crimes that we have prosecuted. And this has led to convictions, although they seem few, but in the face of the complexity and the nature of this crime, it is significant to say that 38 convictions in one year is a highly relevant uh, statistic and shows the efforts that we've achieved. Now, in the area of prevention, we have been able to uh, inform and raise awareness among the public through bulletins, information that alerts the uh, public about the crime. And looking at this from the perspective of their daily lives and their communities, the joint efforts have also allowed us to develop coordinated uh, initiatives. For example, when we've had a case be brought before the courts, through the uh, rapid response teams, we can follow up the victims, we follow up the cases in court so that we can ensure due process of law and the protection of the victims' uh, rights, which needs to be our central focus. So we've seen a lot of progress, but overall, 
these were the two key areas that I wanted to highlight that are part of our interagency coordinated efforts undertaken with other nations. And we have reinforced this. We have many challenges before us, but what's essential is that we have been able to create that synergy between institutions and again, uh, drive these um, moves forward. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for that presentation. Not only do we need sound institutions, but they need to be responsive and uh, timely in their responses. We're moving on to uh, round two of uh, Q&A, and I ask the panelists, uh, given the time constraints, if we could perhaps respond to each question at a max for three minutes at most. It's a very enriching discussion, and I think we'll have an opportunity to continue this discussion in the next dialogues. And I think we'll continue to delve into many of these areas. In this uncertain times. And uh, Ilias, um, it is clear that COVID must have affected the occurrence and response to trafficking in person. Uh, please tell us what has changed in preventing, protecting, and prosecuting TIP during the pandemic, and how will the institutional response look like in a post-COVID uh, context? Thank you very much. Uh, the fact is that the world was caught unprepared on COVID, and unfortunately, we had not looked close enough at regional pandemics in the past, like Zenka, SARS, Ebola, to see what has been the impact on trafficking in persons and what has been, you know, the um, the, the effect on organized crime involvement in in trafficking in persons. So we haven't done that, at least in 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 a lot of detail. So the pandemic caught us by surprise; it caught us unprepared. We saw a significant impact of COVID on trafficking persons, and we are fearing that it will be even worse for the future because of the long-term economic effects of COVID. We see victims abandoned by the traffickers without food or without any other supplies, afraid to go out and seek help because they have no documents, and because of the heavy-handed sometimes approach of the police in enforcing lockdowns. We see children being targeted, especially in online exploitation, Youth is spending a lot of time unsupervised over computers, and we see a lot of reports of, uh, of this type of, uh, of exploitation. We see also victims being left without social services, without access to social services. We see victims being left unable to, uh, to reunite with their families and be repatriated because of closed borders, while at the same time their, uh, their residence permit or the work permit has expired. Um, and th these are real situations that have taken place you know, during these months of, uh, of COVID. We see increasing levels of violence reported by victims. And we see also, unfortunately, trafficking cases which are relating to smuggling flows continue unabated. So smuggling networks continue to smuggle uh, people across borders without you know, any uh, uh, consideration for, for the pandemic. What we're also afraid of, uh, we're concerned of, are the economic impact of the of the pandemic, and things do not look uh, very promising as they are now, to say to say the least. We have reports, we have data, we have uh, findings that show that every time there is uh, a crisis, an economic crisis, trafficking in persons increases. We have seen it in the financial crisis of 2008. We have seen it also in 2010. We have seen it in different regions of the world. So we do expect because trafficking is based on the exploitation of people for money. And when people are desperate for jobs or are desperate for, uh, you know, to, to make ends meet, uh, they may fall, fall uh, victims easier to, to traffickers. So we are concerned about the long-term uh, effects of the pandemic. I don't think uh, that we should let our guard down during this period, I don't think we can, uh, we, we have to choose between safeguarding public health and protecting the victims of trafficking persons. We think that these two things can be done at the same time. There are good practices, specialized units that have been created on trafficking uh, in persons, both at the prosecutor and the police uh, forces have been proved crucial because they were very much aware of what could happen to the trafficking victims and they could provide uh, significant support 
rapid reaction uh, also capacity is not uh, a bad idea. As uh, Ms. Correa mentioned earlier on, I think that's it's, it's a very good idea, especially in times of crisis, that could also be also natural disaster. And the, uh, the increase, we, we have to learn to use more also modern technologies in the fight against trafficking in persons. And this is something that we could do more. They have proven extremely valuable in this, uh, in this, in this situation. You can see this, this forum, for example, for discussion that it's like in place because of technology that relatively cheap to, uh, to install and, and use. So these are the, uh, the means that we have to learn to use more in the future. I know that Latin America, for example, has, I think I've seen a study recently, one of the lowest percentages of the use of modern technologies in, uh, in the fight against trafficking in persons. And we have also to look more at data and understanding the current situation better than we did in the past. We are actually working on a thorough study on the impact of the pandemic on trafficking in persons that should be ready um, by March next year. I would like to thank you. Thank you, Elias, and uh, thank you. Very, very complex and challenging scenario for uh, this uh, crime in the future. Uh, now, I would like to hear from Ambassador Richman. Looking forward, Ambassador, what are the main challenges to law enforcement and justice institutions of our region in combating tips in a post-COVID context? You know, first, let me just, um... Uh, emphasize and associate myself with everything Ilias just said. I, I think he's absolutely right about the impact on of COVID and these shutdown orders, um, making people more vulnerable. Um, you know, to your point about law enforcement, I think there are um, there are several things that would be incredibly helpful that we've seen as best practices around the world when they're effectively implemented. You know, we talk about specialized investigative units or specialized prosecutorial units. And many countries have established them on paper, but the re what is in reality matters. It, it isn't just designating a prosecutor or an investigator and saying, in addition to all the other work you're doing, also you're gonna be our point of contact for trafficking. Instead of making trafficking the added task of an investigator, we need these specialized units to be uh, freed up where their primary task is actually to do trafficking cases. Oftentimes when I meet specialized units, they're busy on other matters. We need to free them up where they can actually work cases, particularly forced labor cases, which take more time to develop. Um, we, need it, we need investigators and prosecutors who are evaluated, who are promoted, who are recognized in their annual reviews because of actually working on trafficking cases. The way to get the next patch on the uniform or the next practical um, implementation of specialized units um, really matters. Another thing that I think uh, that prosecutors offices and law enforcement agencies could do is hire victim witness um, specialists, victim witness coordinators, social workers who are not part of the investigative team, but are attached to that investigative team and focus on stabilizing the victim, making sure the victim understands about postponements or continuances of court hearings, knows where to go, knows where to sit, knows, knows how to engage with the criminal justice system. Uh, it's a fairly low resource, but high yield um, intervention. Um, I think there are many things that can be done, um, but it all focuses around specialization and focuses around individuals. Uh, you know, traffickers do not traffic populations. They traffic people and every survivor is different. Every survivor responds to trauma differently, and we need to have individualized and tailored approaches about how we're investigating cases um, and how we're caring for survivors. Investigators need to be trained not just in how to interview the stereotypical victim, they need to have multiple interview strategies and techniques available to them so that they can shift gears if they need to and approach a victim differently than the last victim they interviewed based on that victim's uh, responses. So I think tailoring and specializing our investigative work, our prosecutorial work, thinking about friendlier ways to engage the criminal justice system are, are really important. And it's gonna require governments to prioritize and resource them. We need to build out our public justice delivery systems like you would improve your country's infrastructure in other areas just like you would improve an electrical grid or a sewer system in a country, you need to build out an effective public justice system that can 
practically deliver the promises that the laws provide. And I think as we are in this COVID environment, as we are dealing with self-imposed government shutdowns, um, I think we have to uh, deal with the fact that all of this benefits the traffickers. If there's any group of people on earth right now who are prospering, it is the traffickers. You know, the, the victims have less services. They're less likely to be identified. Traffickers are continuing to operate with impunity and that impunity is growing. We have to address this. And I agree with, uh, with Ilias that this is not a time to pull back. We can do more than one thing at once. We can emphasize public health, but we also must continue to uh, faithfully apply our laws to protect human rights, particularly in this space of trafficking. Thank you, Ambassador. Wonderful uh, insights and also ideas, practical ideas in, in, in what to do and implement and, and the urgency to do it and, and now and, and continue doing it. Um, now, eh, quiero pasar a Rosa. Rosa, eh, ¿cómo han sobrellevado las consecuencias? Rosa, how have you overcome the consequences of the pandemics and COVID and Honduras, and especially, especially due to the fact that you had two devastating hurricanes in the region? Thank you once again. Yes, the country and the whole world and many regional countries in Central America have gone through the not only the pandemic, but recently Honduras and some other countries in Central America, we have been victims of these natural catastrophes which have affected more than half of the total population in our country. Most unfortunately, this has resulted in greater vulnerability. With the pandemics, we already had quite a critical situation with our victims and the population in general, loss of jobs, loss of micro enterprises, problems of access to the education system due to lack of technology or tools that would allow the children of our victims to stay in the educational system. All this social exclusion, discrimination, marginalization, which has resulted in the fact that a very large proportion of our population is at risk. They can be exploited by unscrupulous people and organized crime in human trafficking. We were looking for an alternative. Unfortunately, with the pandemic, we lost the possibility of being face to face, but technology offers us a great work tool. At the beginning of March and April, we detected that we had an important number of cases due to cyberspace against children. We call it child pornography as in many other countries of the region. But as far as human rights, let's say that these are sexual abuse crimes against our children. So we had to work in order to prevent this crime and cyber crimes. So we started training the teachers and key population to inform them about this possibility of this type of crime, how should they handle adequately and responsibly social networks and communication technologies in order to avoid all potential risks, which through social networks and internet expose our children and our vulnerable population to seduction online, sexual crimes, trafficking, or the theft of identity. We believe that the work online has allowed us to reach an important part of the population and of key professionals in order to be able to avoid these crimes. And also we have been able to, this has generate more data because now we know it more clearly what is going on. And this also offers us the possibility of identifying the crimes. 
we have several open cases right now, the unity against human trafficking, the cyber crime unity of Interpol are prosecuting these crimes. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rosa. Minister Dames. have been using uh, uh, digital media in their communication efforts to prevent it. Thank you so much. So we, we in the Bahamas, uh, we are acutely aware that, the, that there has been a significant uh, global change in the way the world has had to conduct business in light of this COVID-19 uh, pandemic. As a result, your tip, our TIPS team trafficking in persons team has had to alter the manner in which it communicates its message uh, throughout the country. We have increased as a result our focus towards a more virtual platform to communicate our message. We have also strengthened our relationships with some of the leading service providers in telecommunications um, throughout the country for the sole purposes of, of reaching as many persons as possible. We're very cognizant of the fact that despite this reality that we are in a global pandemic, that the business of trafficking this nefarious business of trafficking in persons continues regardless. And so being cognizant of that, we continue to strengthen our relationships with law enforcement with the view that they increase their presence throughout the country, despite the many lockdowns and um, law enforcement, um, the many lockdowns and orders that are issued by the government to ensure that persons remain safe. And so the virtual platform is where we have been doing our business for the most part. Um, and where possible, where social distancing can be applied, our, our committee have been very, very, very uh, much out there throughout the communities. And so some of the things that we have been doing as a result to ensure that we continue to push this message out, whether it's virtually or whether it's uh, by way of the communities where possible, we have uh, certainly our team have been prominently featured, for example, on some of the local news um, feeds, um, communicating the message uh, throughout the length and breadth of our nation. And so some of our, our teams have been appearing on, on local um, news stations, um, sharing the news of trafficking educating um, the wider community uh, about this nefarious business. We have also partnered with some of our leading local uh, food chains and clothing stores. Um, and that has worked tremendously for us. In that regard, we have been able to distribute uh, throughout the country message um, brochures, as well as book, book, bookmarkers, so that those customers who are visiting these locations are very, very much aware that the business of trafficking continues and we need their support and assistance wherever possible to ensure that 
you know, we isolate those persons who are uh, involved and put them before the courts. Our TIPS teams as well, we have been making appearances on local live talk, sh talk shows to ensure that the message continues to resonate uh, throughout our nation. We have engaged in very, very um, productive and successful partnerships uh, with some of the leading movie uh, cinemas throughout the nation who have so graciously afforded us the opportunity to display during intermissions on their billboards and on their screens, um, um, tips, messages, positive messages um, about prevention and education. We have erected throughout our nation um, in key areas and public areas, uh, billboards, getting the message of trafficking throughout the country. Uh, and this has worked um, really tremendously for us. We have built relationships with some of the leading cell phone providers uh, throughout the country, one in particular. And as a result, we have been able to disseminate thousands of text messages um, to customers on, on their platform. So we have, we have also um, been able through our government arm and our technology, our government technology arm to, to use the, the email blasts to ensure that uh, throughout our, our government agencies that we continue to, to push the message and recognizing that we are in this COVID period and that a business such as trafficking in persons will continue to flourish, that we desperately need the help of law enforcement as I would have mentioned earlier. And so we continue to engage law enforcement in training uh, exercises and that has been working very well for us um, as well as um, intelligence and interdiction exercises. And so this pro certainly provides us with that opportunity because we know that our first responders are out there now in even greater numbers, uh, ensuring that persons remain safe. And um, last but not least, uh, we continue through, to work through our leading um, university, that's the University of the Bahamas, and ensuring too that our young people who are often out there that they understand the message of trafficking. And so we continue our initiatives um, by way of our tertiary level um, institutions to ensure that you know, they clearly understand that the business of trafficking is a serious one and that we need their support and that we need them uh, to work and partner with us to get the message out. So we are in... Uh, really some different times as a result of uh, this pandemic. But I think, you know, the message here is that um, while it calls for a new order, so to speak, it has uh, certainly caused us to certainly focus introspectively and to look at more innovative ways to get the message out. And I think as a result, this certainly has increased our reach. Um, and so if there's one positive thing that, that we say that we, we would have garnered from this is that it, it certainly would have increased our reach and we're now reaching out to even more people as a result. And persons now have time to focus in on message, the message coming, especially through the virtual platform. Thank you. Thank you, Minister, and for your... Uh sharing your in, innovative ideas and ways of how Bahamas responded. Uh, now, quiero volver a Brasil, Secretario. I would now like to come back to Brazil, Secretary Panuero. What is Brazil doing in order to work with the most vulnerable populations in the traffic in persons? I give you three minutes, Mr. Secretary, please. 
Obrigado. Eu procurarei respeitá-los. É... Thank you very much. I'm going to try to stick to those three minutes. In the beginning of our discussion, it has already been said that trafficking in persons really takes advantage of uh, poverty. And the poverty levels increased in the population with all the losses due to the crisis. So the Brazilian government has created an income transfer program, which we call in Portuguese an emergency assistance, like a minimum amount so that the poorer populations would be able to survive during the pandemic periods. In figures through this program, we've contemplated 150,000 foreigners who are in Brazil as refugees and approximately 60 million Brazilians. This represents a huge gains for this population because once these people receive these resources, they are less vulnerable to the approaches by traffickers. So from the government point of view, within the time allotted to me, I believe this would be the major initiative by our government in order to face the pandemic and as a consequence, to be able to mitigate the approaches by traffickers. Thank you. Camila, thank you so much, Mr. Secretary. I come back to Chile now. Chile has always been a country that is used to be threatened by catastrophes such as fires and earthquakes. Could you please tell us what has COVID meant for Chile with regard to human trafficking and the challenges? Three minutes, please, Camila. Natalie, we have been monitoring the fact whether this uh, crimes has increased during the pandemics because we have observed this phenomenon in the region and in our countries and in our view the number of cases has not increased but we have seen the number of victims not of cases as compared to previous years we believe that pandemic may have helped to show better some sectors which are more vulnerable, certain businesses, and this has helped identify a greater number of victims as compared to previous years. As you well said, we do have experience in natural catastrophes and emergencies, and due to this, the action plan that we launched in 2019, we incorporated this as a new scenario for vulnerability. And we started working with the National Emergency Office on a protocol that will allow to identify victims and the victims that are identified are sent to this intersectoral uh, protocol. We have not published yet this mechanism, but we want to take this into account. And thank you. Thank you, Camila. I will now give the floor to Secretary Felix. Could you please tell us what you have done in Mexico? Three minutes, please. Thank you. I will share three elements. First of all, Humanity is facing a challenge for which we were not ready in the case of Mexico. The way in which this has been dealt with by the central government has created a new way of working. The first element is not to accept any credits from uh, the other countries to face this crisis. We are facing it with austerity. So we have reduced the salaries of high ranking officials. Nobody should make a higher salary than the president of the Republic. 
And this is how we were able to avoid increasing our current expenditure for non-essential measures. This formula implemented by the President of the Republic uh, refers to a structural problem because the health system of Mexico had been weakened. We were facing a sanitary emergency, a pandemic, without sufficient institutional capacity, sufficient doctors to face the pandemic. So with this, we had to face three challenges, first of all, an economic crisis due to this uh, disactivation with repercussions on the most vulnerable sectors, the health crisis due to the pandemics. And the third one is a general crisis of violence, especially violence against women. And I wanted to insist on this. In our country today, we have 108,000 persons that have died of COVID. We have more than 1 million cases of COVID. They're mainly young people ages 20 to 25, but this has shown us that we did not have the necessary structures to face the situation. And the least protected sectors were those who did not have opportunities and also who did not have sufficient resources to face this uh, health emergency and we observed the problem there was a reduction in prostitution but forced labor increased so there was an in this has been enforced with the use of social media we they are looking for work requests which are not honest and this has allowed for a new way of trafficking so uh, the confinement of people uh, has made us find a wider range of victims basically the country entities that have observed this type of uh, problems are the states that are in the northern border with the United States and also in the tourism sector. In some cases, the borders have been opened gradually, and this has increased the use of tourism spaces in Mexico, especially beaches. But this is an important challenge in these three crises. When borders will open and the pandemic will increase, then we will have this problem which has been contained for the past few months. We are foreseeing the need to create institutions to face this problem and giving elements of health to the marginal, marginalized sectors of the population. Thank you so much, Felix. We have seven minutes left. We have seven members of the panelists. I am tempted to ask one more question, but I, if you commit to give me one minute per reply, just one sentence to motivate our second panel, I will ask the State Department and the colleagues of you, and you know, DD, Ambassador Richmond. Oh, no, probably I will ask this one. Where should Latin America and the Caribbean focus their efforts uh, to move the needle? I know it's, 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 a, it's a big question, but just an idea uh, that can inspire us. Uh, so Ambassador Richmond, and then after Ambassador Elias, thank you. So in terms of one idea to move the needle for the next panel, which is I understand focused on businesses and supply chains, I would encourage every business to take seriously its burden to investigate, map, and vet its own supply chains to make sure that there's not forced labor in any of their procurement. You know, I think it's critical that not only do they map their supply chains and remediate if there's a problem, but they call upon other governments um, as a business owner to actually make sure they're doing their work to investigate, prosecute, and convict traffickers provide services to victims um, as they move forward. 
Thank you, Ambassador. Ilya? Thank you. For me, it's to continue the work that we have started already, continue focusing on and, and deepening our engagement in this, in this field, continue strengthening investigations and prosecutions, continue strengthening victim and uh, assistance and protection measures, and not to be dissuaded by the current crisis. It will go away. Things will come back to the situation we knew before. We'll come back to normal. We have to be ready also for the next time. Thank you. Thank you, Ilias. A question for our countries very quickly. Which is the greatest challenge that the countries see in the future? Brazil, please. On our part, it seems to us at the Justice Ministry and at the level of the Brazilian government is that the main uh, challenge is to make the network more capillar because the trafficker will move through different routes getting their victim. What is important is to expand these networks, both to find the crime and to identify victims, to have greater capillarity over our territory in Brazil. This is our proposition. I thank you very much for your invitation and I wish IGB and all the organizers lots of success. Thank you. Secretario, una frase. One sentence, please. Thank you. We have three challenges. First of all, increase the training of our civil servants, create the conditions in order to implement the law according to the Palermo Protocol and to, typic, to identify clearly the crime and also identify this and connect it with other crimes such as forced disappearance. Thank you. Thank you, Secret Secretary Camila, please. I want to speak about three major challenges. First, prevention, prevention for the population in general. And I believe that international organizations such as the IDB can help us with a regional campaign. As far as prosecution goes, we also have many challenges in order to prosecute the institutions. These are transnational crimes and we need to have investigations because this crime is linked to other crimes. Thank you. Thank you, Camila. Minister Dane. Could you share with us the pressing challenge for the Bahamas? I'm here, thank you. So the act of uh, trafficking transcends our respective borders, languages and cultures which is a strong indicator that all nations in the regions must prioritize this dehumanizing industry. Similarly, the protection of humans, particularly women and children from sexual and domestic exploitation must have a meaningful participation in safety and security matters. Globally, approximately 71% of enslaved humans are women and children or girls, which means that all governments must strengthen our institutions to protect this vulnerable group. In recent years, there has been an increase in female victims being transported and transited through the Bahamas for sexual and domestic exploitation, particularly from many countries throughout the region. This means that the Bahamas, along with other governments, must effectively establish memorandums of understanding to prevent, protect, and prosecute those involved. Our awareness campaign must expand beyond our national audiences to incorporate new norms and trends emerging in human trafficking. I thank you. Thank you, Minister. Uh, Rosa. Para cerrar, desafío para Honduras. Rosa, just to conclude, what do you see as challenges for Honduras? Thank 
Creo que hemos... I think we have uh, lost the connection with Honduras. No, I'm right here. Rosa, go ahead. No, I didn't hear you. Just very quickly, I believe that it is essential that we reinforce our institutionality in order to be effective in addressing this uh, challenge. We need to work at the pre prevention, protecting victims, as, as well as prosecuting crimes. But it's also essential that our actions need to have it at, at the center a focus addressing the victim's needs, centered on the victim's needs, so that we're able to expand and at the same time address their situation, their needs, their priorities, their specifics in terms of providing comprehensive, holistic services that are aware of the need to access, equal access to justice through legal proceedings that provide a response reflecting the respect and the insurance of their rights. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rosa. And that's precisely what you just pointed out has been key as a part of our dialogue here. That's the issue, dealing with the victims. So I want, I'd want i like to thank all of the participants for this very fruitful and productive uh, discussion. I think we've seen a 360 degree view and um, I, we could spend hours talking on the subject, and I know we have many more questions, but I'd like to thank all of you for your active participation and your total commitment to this topic that we're all concerned with. I'd now like to offer the floor to my colleague uh, Adela, and once again, thank you all for being with us. Thank you, Natalie. Very fascinating discussion about um, the capacities of uh, institutions involved in <clears throat> justice and uh, <clears throat> criminal prosecution, especially now with uh, in, the, in the midst of this uh, crisis with the pandemic. I want to thank all of you dealing with this uh, key issue that is essential to um, development. We're going to take a short break so you can have some coffee or maybe just stand up and stretch a little bit. We'd like to um, also like to distribute a survey for your uh, responses. We'd like to get your feedback. You can do it very easily just through this uh, code. I'm going to turn on some uh, background music. And then once we finish with that, we will con we will resume with part two of our dialogue.
espero que hayan podido tomarse un espacio para traerse un cafecito o estirarse. Ahora daremos inicio al segundo panel. Let's now continue with our second panel. How can the private sector contribute to the um, institutional efforts in dealing with um, trafficking in persons? So now I'd like to offer the floor to Mariano Bosch, Chief of the Division on Labor Markets of the Inter-American Development Bank. Go ahead, Mariano. Well, thank you very much. And a welcome to all of you to the second panel of the day. I think the discussions have been uh, very um, encompassing and enriching. And the second panel, basically what we're going to do is uh, discuss the role of the private sector in combating this scourge uh, known as uh, trafficking in persons. Let me just give you a broad overview. I want to identify three key areas where the private sector can play a crucial role in this effort to combat uh, trafficking in persons. So the first area has to do with prevention, investigation, or criminal investigations. In these uh, areas, we can play a critical role. In some countries, working directly with local law enforcement to also create a greater awareness raising among uh, victims and also distribute information, uh, work with the transportation, maritime sectors, the hospitality sectors, the healthcare sector, so that we can detect, identify and, and prevent uh, these uh, crimes. But I, so again, the private sector is crucial in developing a corporate culture that uh, truly ensures that their value chains are completely freed of for any forced labor. And I think a lot can be done in this area in terms of best practices and monitoring by the providers of uh, jobs, inclusion that includes um, health and uh, security standards that again can prevent the possibility of forced labor. And I think we can be much more effective when businesses throughout the whole sector cooperate. So for part of our today's discussion is to understand those coordinating mechanisms that are available that can facilitate interaction with the public sector as well. One example of this type of initiative would be, for example, in terms of electronic um, interface. The private sector, I think, also plays a part, as was mentioned earlier, in centering the focus on our victims, on the victims in the discussion. So again, the, fo the focus on reintegrating those victims where the private sector can facilitate uh, jobs creation to reinsert these people, these victims back into uh, the jobs and um, societal processes. So not just combat trafficking in persons, but also bring back and help and re reinsert those victims of uh, human trafficking. So in our second panel, we're going to be looking at various approaches as to how, how the private sector can contribute meaningfully to these uh, initiatives. We have six outstanding panelists. We're going to share their experiences from government, from the uh, private sector, and uh, from multilateral organizations. So now we have uh, our moderator. We have Dulce Batista, who will now help us address this very crucial issue. Go ahead, uh, Dulce. Thank you very much for your intervention, Mariano. I just wanted to say that for this panel, we have a, a top-notch speakers that come from throughout the world. We're from Guatemala. We have the Minister of Labor, Rafael Eugenio Rodriguez Palacer from Colombia. We have Gloria Beatriz Gaviria Ramos, Chief of Cooperation and National Relations in the Ministry of Labor in Colombia from Brazil. We have we have Thais Faria, a regional fundamental rights officer for the Latin American Caribbean region, International Labor Organization. And then we also have Matias Thorne, a deputy secretary general of the International Organization of Employers. 
And from Mexico City, we have Ana Lorena Vigil, who is the police liaison for Latin America and the Caribbean. And from San Francisco, we have Ana Daton, who is from Texas Traffic, uh, Texas Against Trafficking. So the panel is going to be divided into three segments that includes Q&A. Each panelist will be able to speak for about three minutes in the presentation, and then we will be taking questions from the audience through our chat. And then we will defer to our guest speakers at the end of the discussion. So Minister Rodriguez, we ask you, has Guatemala has developed an office for interagency coordination to combat the trafficking of persons. Can you just describe the inner workings of this interagency initiative? Well, thank you very much for your time and for inviting me here. And I'm gonna get right to the question, but thank you again for inviting me and uh, just convey greetings to everybody. Yes, I would like to discuss this from my ministry, Ministry of Work of Labor in Guatemala. We are focused on combating the trafficking of persons and sexual exploitation of people that goes back to the very beginning where we looked at uh, human trafficking in different uh, manifestations and modality that includes uh, labor exploitation, child uh, labor, and this scourge takes on various forms that are uh, reprehensible and need to be prosecuted. Our legislation in Guatemala establishes a sentence of uh, eight to 20 years when someone is uh, exploited for economic benefits in this regard. So what we have done in order to better prevent, protect and prosecute the, these crimes is that the ministry in coordination with the uh, prosecutor's office and the attorney general's office at the federal level providing support for boys, girls, adolescents, we signed an agreement aimed at allowing for a comprehensive approach in dealing with uh, forced labor. And this agreement was signed on July 20th, 2019. And as a result, we've established an authority that coordinates interagency efforts against uh, child labor and forced labor. This was formalized through the an, an amendment introduced a year later on October 15, 2020. And basically we signed this and created this authority working in interagency efforts that would uh, support efforts to combat uh, the, the um, trafficking in persons and forced labor. We needed to have a group of authorities responsible. This coordinating body would do that where we have uh, CISERTI, which has now begun to uh, work with representatives from each institution. By the way, the chairmanship rotates between the various agencies. And we have now provided support with social programs, working with the Ministry of Labor. We were able to, in addition to all of the responsibilities taken on to address the victim's needs, we also provided uh, resources and the attorney general's office was focused on restoring these children back to their families and this joint effort has allowed us to achieve effective results in our reparations thank you thank you minister gloria how what measures have been adopted in order to prevent and uh, combat combat uh, the trafficking in persons, especially in the area of forced labor. Could you just discuss some of your findings? And in the Ministry of Labor, we have created a committee working with the uh, Ministry of the Interior where we have articulated and identified guidelines to combat this serious uh, crime. What the ministry does 
again, focused on crime prevention and dealing with um, trafficking in persons that includes that when we have um, trafficking in persons, we're looking at um, the preventing um, such things as uh, exploitation, sexual exploitation, and the, the policies were developed in a totally participatory manner, working in consultation with civil society, with uh, labor unions, and we believe that this policy has allowed us to work together with uh, institutions, supporting uh, families, and we have successfully identified this, these very serious crimes, especially when they're associated with sexual exploitation of young people and working in the ministry, we, together with other organizations, are developing guidelines to ensure that inspectors have the resources to identify cases of forced labor. Inspectors, therefore, need to be trained adequately so that they can find cases of and un, 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 reveal cases of forced labor. They're working in coordination with other institutions, which means we need to work together, come, you, uh, bring together our efforts. We need have to have training for all our officials, and we also need to raise a greater awareness among the public so that they are cognizant of these crimes. Thank you, Gloria. The ILO has several people from all over the world working on policies in and programs in order to promote decent work. Can you tell us about how ILO works with the private sector in order to combat the trafficking in persons? Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me. And I'd also like to greet my colleagues here. The ILO, we have, uh, the ILO has three parts. So we are formed by government, employers and workers. So all the decisions that are taken, not only during the international conference, but also when we are working on the work plans, involves these three parts and they are equally participating in the process, government, employers and workers. So it's important to say that the ILO from the beginning worked with forced labor. We have some conventions and forced work and trafficking in persons are topics. And we can mention Convention 29, Protocol 29, which is the most recent one and was also mentioned today, Convention 105 about forced labor, and also the two conventions about child labor because this is also included in this modality we're talking about. And this is our framework for the development of our programs. Some of the initiatives are specific for the private sector, and we could mention them very quickly. In 2011, we have already mentioned this, but the uh, Human Rights Council of the UN approved some principles in order to implement the framework to protect and to resolve. And this has to do with the declaration from 1998, declaration 
the declaration, the ILO declaration has four principles, eradication of child labor, forced labor, non-discrimination, and promoting um, free negotiations. So in the UN framework, the ILO has been organizing work specifically in these areas. And this is part of our work and part of the common effort to implement these principles. I'd also like to mention the three-part declaration about national companies and policies. So we give elements to companies, multinational companies. We have these principles on our website, and we also have a help desk, a specific group that is available for the private sector companies in order to uh, consider the eradication and the other elements. We don't have a lot of time, so I will comment on the other subjects in the next questions. Employers uh, represents the business sector in discussions on social and labor policy issues at the ILO, at the United Nations, at the G G20, among other forums. Uh, can you tell us how your organization and the private sector in general seek to influence the fight against human trafficking? Thank you so much and thank you for inviting me to this important panel and greetings to all of you from very cold and winterly Geneva. Um, yeah, as you rightly said, we are the voice of employers of business within, within the ILO and that since 100 years. That means we are not one of many stakeholders, but we are directly engaged in the negotiations and the um, development of international standards. And we have played a key role, for instance, in the development on the forced labor protocol from 2014, which is focusing also on human trafficking and recommendations 203, which accompanies the protocol. And other ILO instruments, as for instance, on the fair, recru the fair recruitment principles. We also host the GFMD business mechanism, the GFMD, the Global Forum on Migration and Development, and we are the voice at this Global Forum on Migration and Development. And what we do as a voice of business, bringing the issue of human trafficking, bringing the issue of fair recruitment into the GFMD process. But we believe it's not enough just to try to prosecute, to find the trafficker. We need to address their market, right? We need to make sure that there are legal passes for migration so people don't need to hand over their life to traffickers. So that is the reason why within the GFMD, we're fighting very much to open up these legal passes for migration. Our strength is our network. Our members are the National Business and Employers Federation in 150 countries around the world, representing more than 50 million companies, like in Guatemala, it's um, Cassif in um, Colombia, it's and it is at national level that we make sure that these international standards are actually implemented and enforced. Because not enough just to have implement international standards, but we need to make sure that these standards make it to the national level and they are really enforced at the national level. And our members, our national employers and business federation are very much engaged on that. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Matthias. Ana Lorena. É, Uber oferece sessões informativas a condutores sobre como identificar situações de trata de pessoas. Now, how do we also identify human trafficking and how can we um, bring forth uh, complaints and alerts, even anonymously? Can you talk a little bit about this initiative? Yes, for the last three years, we've been working on this initiative in Mexico, but we work with uh, the NGO on uh, human trafficking and with where experts conducted a study to understand the business model and see how the uh, partners can become more engaged in detecting these um, the human trafficking aspects. So we'd identified various indicators so that we could raise a greater awareness and they could identify these situations. Sometimes they may face these situations without even knowing or suspecting that they might be seeing or witnessing human trafficking. So we needed to raise an awareness and provide them with the tools so that they could identify these cases and situations. Subsequently, we also worked with the Citizens Committee to provide them with a hotline so that they could report these kinds of crimes anonymously. So the next phase of the project has been working in various uh, 
uh, cities throughout the country with local authorities where we've had uh, awareness raising sessions where we provided much more information as to how we define the uh, trafficking of persons. How can we identify cases of them? Looking at specific case studies so that it's more easy to identify their characteristics. And the authorities also work with them in terms of how to file complaints. Sometimes people don't really know what's going to happen if they do bring forth uh, complaints. Are they a part of the investigation after that? So it's essential that the authorities in discuss this, uh, the specifics and also answer questions and clarify doubts. As I was saying, this initiative began three years ago in Mexico and we have been implementing it, actually replicating it in other countries throughout the region, working together with NGOs and um, working or else working with uh, UNODC or local authorities. We're also working with the Blue Cross uh, campaign on July 30th, we informed those um, involved, the stakeholders, the users to generate a greater awareness through this platform. Thank you, Anna. Hannah. Of company working with global experts to help end human trafficking through the use of technology. Can you tell us more about your work? Yes, thank you so much for having me here today. I'm delighted to be with you all. As you said, my name is Hannah Darnton. I'm an Associate Director of Ethics, Technology and Human Rights here at BSR or Business for Social Responsibility. And one of my roles here is leading the Tech Against Trafficking Coalition, which is a coalition of technology companies, including Amazon, AT&T, BT, Microsoft and Salesforce that have come together to collaborate with global experts to help eradicate human trafficking using technology. We were launched in the summer of 2018, and our real goal is to work with civil society, law enforcement, academia, survivors, and actors such as those on this call to identify and support tech solutions that can disrupt and reduce human trafficking, prevent and identify crimes, and that provide remedy mechanisms for victims and survivors. We kicked off our work together by really saying, what can we create to help the field tackle these issues? How can we create a new technology, perhaps a new tech solution that would help solve different challenges within this space? But to inform our strategy and what this would look like, we first actually undertook a landscape analysis to better understand the technology tools that were already being used across this field. And what we quickly found was that there are so many in existence already. There were over 300 tools that we identified in the course of our first 12 months together that were in operation to tackle trafficking around the globe. And so we took those 300 technology tools and took a look at what was there. And we saw so much replication, duplication. Over 70 tools, for example, were focused on victim or trafficker identification alone. There were more trafficking tools that were addressing case management within nonprofits. There were others looking at ethical shopping. So many different types of tools, but not all were able to work effectively and efficiently because they didn't have the support, the technical knowledge, the technical expertise that they needed. So we actually decided rather than create a new tool, another tool within the space, that we would help to support those anti-trafficking organizations on the ground on the ground already deploying technology and help them face the challenges that they were experiencing in the use of technology to help them better implement these technologies at scale to fight this issue together. And that's what we've been doing for about the past three years. And I'm happy to share more about our experiences, learnings, and what we hope to do in the future throughout this call. Thank you very much, uh, Hannah. Uh, regresamos a Guatemala. Minister Rodriguez, which other measures has Guatemala taken in cooperation with the private sector to combat the human trafficking? Thank you. Following up uh, on the first reply, within this coordination that we have amongst the fourth uh, institutions, we also created an com information campaign called I am also in and I will 
inform. So we are trying to inform anonymously the exploitation of adults and children. So we have called upon the information on children exploitation, participation in illegal activities. Some of these have been sent directly to the Ministry of Labor and some to all. And we also created a hotline in the public ministry because these are all crimes. This cooperation does not mean that each institution will stop meeting its institutional goals. It has strengthened our cooperation. For instance, within the Ministry of Labor, we have tried to bring closer the private sector, for instance, the agricultural chamber, and it became clear that rural employees have to be conscious of the fact to avoid and prevent child labor, which is a scourge in Guatemala. And we have already started to take action. For instance, we have also offered kindergarten and schools in some of the rural spaces where the parents work, and we also increase controls in the sector to avoid these practices. There is still a lot to be done, but we have already shared the responsibility with all the companies so that we should avoid this type of practices. We are also elaborating a bill to strengthen the inspection work and the International Labor Organization has also helped us in this endeavor in order to carry out an extensive study of child labor in the sugar production. And this is in order to help the private sector in order to eradicate child labor and obtain the expected results. And we are trying to eliminate this practice. Nevertheless, this year, as we know, has been a difficult year for everybody. And it was difficult to make further progress due to the closure of schools. And this, of course, contributed to the fact that some of the progresses which had been obtained have been uh, reversed because children started helping their parents in the rural areas. We hope that this will change next year and that through this coordination, we will be able to avoid these practices until they are completely eliminated. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister Gloria. In Colombia, which other measures have you taken with the private sector with regard to the traffic in human persons? Gloria? Can you hear me? Yes, we can. We, as the Ministry of Labor of Guatemala told you, we have several joint efforts, especially with regard to child labor. In Colombia, we have a network which is called Red de Empresas, a corporation network made up of several corporations of the private sector and with the participation of the Ministry of Labor and some United Nations agencies. This network is working to eliminate child labor in corporations and in supply chains. This has been very important because it has allowed to eradicate child labor. There are other measures, especially with regard to human trafficking and also with regard to the facts that were mentioned in our previous intervention. The ministries and all the institutions are continuing to work and develop efforts in order to avoid and eradicate social exploitation and together with the Ministry of Trade, we work hand in hand in order to train and obtain commitments from the tourism sector, zero tolerance to social exploitation. We also have whistleblower channels in case we suspect that 
a child is a victim of sexual violence. Social actors are very important, especially in the private sector. And as we mentioned before, public policy that we have created was created hand in hand with the corporations of the private sector. I want to mention something very important. Perhaps I did not mention this before. In one of the exercises carried out by the Ministry of Labor of Colombia in order to identify fraudulent uh, labor, we launched a prevention campaign through a fraudulent work offer asking people to fill out forms and this is why we were trying to show that there is an asymmetry in information. So what did we discover with this campaign? This was very important. After sending this form, people were immediately sent to a site of the ministry where they were informed about the main characteristics of this type of work offers. So how could we make people know that these offers were fraudulent offers so that we would be able to train them and then to orient them to official job search agencies like the employment agency in Colombia. Why was this practical exercise so important? Because this is how young people could understand how they could be attracted to fraudulent job offers. Another important element on which we have been working hand in hand with the private sector and within our regional initiatives is regarding the Venezuelan migration. Colombia has a very high rate of Venezuelan migrants and the Venezuelan migrants are a very vulnerable population and they're very vulnerable to these sort of crimes. So we are working hand in hand with international organizations in order to help this population not to fall into this trap. Thank you. Thank you, Gloria. Thais, a private sector was a critical role for the victims and survivors through employment, through the fair recruitment initiative, uh, ILO has been doing a great job, but they also have been working with other players in Brazil. Could you please talk about these initiatives? Thank you. Of course, thank you very much for this opportunity. I'd like to speak about these concrete actions. We have the so-called legislative and policy plans. We have uh, on the one plan, uh, on the one hand, plans that are designed and also direct actions. I'm going to mention a few of these direct actions, especially with the involvement of the private sector. First of all, I must say that there is a great non-discrimination commitment. In other words, these people are already victims who belonged to excluded groups. Here in Brazil, for example, most of the victims are Black uh, people, mostly women, people who were part of other groups of exclusion, such as the case for LGBT. You. This is why it is so important to have the engagement of companies in this area. I'd like to mention to you an experience that was initiated last year. It was an operation that was called Godmother, uh, oriented towards the victims of trafficking in people. This was the federal government, federal police, and the Sao Paulo state government in order to help in recovering these victims, offering them psychological support, professional training, and the creation of a network that could receive these people, people who survived this crime, enabling them to, to structure their lives again based on more decent work. So to do this, we've also trained these companies because as I've said, it's not the problem is not only being a victim, but also a victim 
belonging from groups that are already excluded uh, previously. Usually, uh, we are talking about groups that are historically excluded from the market. But we did have great involvement on the part of uh, national and multinational companies. And 80% of these victims were assisted. And I believe that the most important part is to say that most of these people did not leave the company because one thing is to integrate yourself, but another thing is to remain because you have to constantly work with these companies to work on this maintenance, to work on the staff. So as ha to have these companies more inclusive and more open-minded. We have another plan, which is Cozinha e Voice, and there is another one, which is called the Specific Support for LGBTQ Programs in 90% of companies, all of them working on this challenge of including the victims of this crime in their companies. Thank you. The international organization of employers is to support the private sector in developing a corporate culture that ensures that its supply chain is free from uh, forced labor. Can you tell us more about this important role you play? Thank you so much. Um, indeed, we have a huge outreach to companies. As I said, our members represent more than 50 million companies. We have several company networks where we directly engage with companies. So we play a big role, not only to directly support the companies, but through our members, reach the big masses of companies, particularly the SMEs, the small and medium-sized companies, which play a huge, huge role in all the companies around the world. We have developed a lot of guidance, sector-specific guidance, for, for the hospitality sector, for the construction sector, how to avoid trafficking, how to avoid um, forced labor. We develop regional guidance at the moment. Together with the ILO, we develop guidance for Africa. So our member federations have something on their hand if they engage with the companies in Africa. We just launched an online tool with ABNWEF, which is a very nice tool um, for middle manager who are engaged in actually in recruiting people. So they know what to look for and in order to avoid trafficking and forced labor. We facilitate peer learning. We have different committees and working groups on migration, on responsible business conduct, on employment, where we bring together federations and companies so they can learn from each other. And we learn from them actually what is necessary uh, in order to eradicate forced labor and human trafficking. We engage very much in networks of networks. We are part of the steering group, um, steering group of the ILO business network on forced labor because it is really important to connecting the dots, right? There are so many initiatives and Hannah actually referred to it, right? She sp spoke about all the tools which are out there. So there's no point in developing everyone their own tools which then just duplicate what is already there. It's important that we amplify and replicate what is there already and complement each other in you know what we are doing. And that is the reason why we are such a big fan of this ILO forced labor business network. We created across Asia and the Middle East focal points, focal points which serve as a um, one-stop shop for companies who have questions, right? So they have someone which they can call in hotline um, for an expert who explains them everything, right? How to find um, forced labor, how to find trafficking within the supply chain, what to do about it, where are partners. So the focal point is really key drive the agenda down from New York and Geneva to the local level in Asia and in the Middle East. Because at the end of the day, we have this discussion too much, you know, at the UN, um, where in Geneva and New York, we all agree. But the point is, how do we make sure that it goes to the ground in other regions? And so that uh, we are very much engaged in. Thank you so much. Thank you, Matthias. Uh, Anna? Uber ha desarrollado acciones con, con conductores. Have you developed measures in the United States and in Canada? Do you have any experience of work in those countries? An experience that is particularly helpful in the work that you're carrying out in the region. I remember that there was a case that was quite uh, present in the media and this 
ended up in criminal prosecution because it was in the media. Would you be kind enough to expand on your work? Yes. The case you referred to was in the United States. A driver notices something during one of his trips. He realizes that maybe this is a case of trafficking, and he informs the authorities. An investigation is carried out, and a person is convicted, and the victims are rescued. So definitely, this is the idea. This is what we are trying to obtain. We want the drivers and the distributors to become an important element for the safety of the communities where they operate. We also want them to be an important element in the cooperation with the authorities. In Canada, this initiative is just starting now in the United States. It has existed for a little bit longer. And what we have observed, the main difference that we have observed in Latin America is the relationship with the authorities and the confidence in the authorities. For instance, in Canada, drivers are asked to report the authorities any situation they may see. In Latin America, perhaps that is not the best way to go. So we worked with anonymous call lines and more safe lines so that people feel safer to report, like Crime Stoppers in different countries and the organization that we have in Mexico. So this is quite important in this situation for the same reasons, since we provide these hotlines for reports, we asked drivers and distributors that they should not inform us because Uber is not the best entity for this. They have to go to the authorities. And by creating this direct link with the anonymous uh, whistleblower lines, there is no way for us to know whether a report has been actually raised, nor what happens afterwards. But this is crucial. We need to give our drivers this safety. We are not going to be involved, so we will not know anything, and we will not be able to take any measures against them if this is one of their concerns. So there is really no way to find out where there have been direct reports or not. In the sessions we have had with drivers, they thank us very much for the information that we provide, and they say that this is going to be useful for them in their day to day because there will be situations which they will be able to observe since they spend so much time in the street and they will be able to report. And in the non-government organization, which is part of our initiative, we are developing a quite an important study with Columbia University in order to measure the impact that this initiative is having, the impact on the communications that are arising from this, and which is the best way to create awareness and, trans and transmit this message so that everybody realizes that this ends up in actionable measures and that we will be able to help the victims of this crime. Thank you, Anna. Human rights, ethics, and technology principles to assess the use of new and emerging technologies in the fight against human trafficking. Can you tell us more about the importance of carrying out an adequate human rights diligence before starting the use of new and emerging technologies? Happy to speak to that. And actually, that's one of my that's really my full-time role here at BSR is focusing on human rights due diligence of the plat products, platforms, and services that technology companies are designing, deploying, and helping spread for use around the world. So we think this is very important. So first off, I think I'd start with a few just comments on what we've learned, because one of the things we have learned is the importance of this due diligence. And I'll start there. And really what we're seeing is these technologies have dual uses. They can be used for good, but they can also be misused and abused, both intentionally and unintentionally. 
And so thinking through how these technologies are deployed, who's using these technologies, the geographies, the context in which they are used is extremely important. And many times that needs to start with those designing and developing the technologies. In-house, they can look at the adverse human rights impacts that a technology might have. For example, if you're creating an AI technology, we can look at the data that's informing the models, the algorithms in that technology. If you're using data that isn't representative of the populations that you're serving and then you're working with, that means that they might not actually put out the appropriate decisions or the appropriate outputs for those using it. For example, we saw the other day, you know, there was an, a facial recognition tool used in Detroit that inaccurately stated that a gentleman had been in the store, I believe, stealing items from the store. And the algorithm hadn't built in enough kind of racial and background ethnic diversity to appropriately identify this uh, individuals of uh, African American origin. And so therefore it was incorrectly making decisions and making uh, generating outputs around this population. And that's something that could have been better tested, better evaluated from the get-go with these technologies developing it. And the same goes for technologies deployed in the anti-trafficking space. We have to test them, conduct adversarial, adversarial testing as we call it in-house to make sure we understand what can go wrong. And furthermore, the downstream human rights impacts of what happens when these technologies go wrong. And so that's something we like to think about quite a bit and not only at the technology level, but as we're transitioning these technologies over to the end users. So this might be a civil society organization starting to use a certain type of technology, deploying it within their work. This might be law enforcement or even researchers looking to aggregate large data sets. At BSR last, at uh, Tech Against Trafficking rather last year, worked with IOM and specifically the Counter Trafficking Data Collaborative to think through the privacy preserving mechanisms that they were using as they aggregated large numbers of case data around trafficking victims. And one of the things that they found is they'd been using technology to make sure that they weren't exposing personally identifiable information of victims within that data set, but they were losing a lot of the data. They weren't able to share it because they were protecting this private information. And so we were able to help them think through, okay, what's another way to protect this private information so that you can actually use all of it? And we created a new privacy preserving mechanism that creates synthetic data that allows you to see overarching trends, not have that data lost, but instead use all of the data without compromising the integrity and the privacy of the data itself. So that's a little bit of an example of how you can think through and work together, civil society and a technology company coming together to say, okay, what are the potential ramifications? If we expose this private information, a trafficker might be able to find a victim that they'd previously trafficked. And that's what we don't want. So we can create new solutions after identifying these problems that help mitigate risks and the human rights risks that can come up with the use of these technologies but it's only by working together, understanding that there are these human rights impacts from the very beginning through the entire life cycle of the technology that we can make sure that we're aware of the risk, that we're mitigating those risks and that we're taking into them into account throughout both that use case as well as the uh, partnerships that we're creating. Muchas gracias, Hannah. Thank you, Hannah. We are now going to Guatemala. I have a question for Mr. Rodriguez. In your country, the ministry coordinates a technical Monsieur work that defines interinstitutional action. It is difficult for one sole organization to have specialists in order to have a comprehensive uh, approach. Could you please share the lessons learned so that this kind of contribution may contribute to the to turn more uh, proficient organization? Let me stress that this cooperation is horizontal, and we take turns amongst representatives and people responsible for these organizations. This motivates all of us to contribute to the space. In Guatemala, 
the coordination has been very good under the president with the Ministry of uh, Work and the presidency, all has worked well. In our ministry, we started work on July 1st. We communicated to the General Prosecutor's Office and they immediately shared the need to create a coordination method. And under the leadership, the General Prosecutor's Office and the group that deals with human trafficking. So we have now the necessary documents to finalize this cooperation. There has been interest and political will to obtain success. This is a shared interest. In our case, and in the case we have been discussing, the victims are the girls, boys, teenagers and women. So we really have to fight this scourge as quickly as possible. In the field, we started with the first measures, we improved the procedures, and so improvements have taken place ever since. The first lesson is to formalize the cooperation in a group where we know who is responsible. We had a coordination convention, but until we give a name to the coordinator and to the responsible people that we see concrete results. The second one was to have a physical space where people could go to report cases. And this should allow all four institutions to be informed because generally when there is a report, there has to be a procedure for this information to go to all four organizations. But now when there is a report, the report reaches all four organizations. The third lesson is to share the leadership. We need to fight against this scourge simultaneously with all of our institutions. And the fourth lessons, there may be many lessons, but the fourth one I will point out is that joint work allows for immediate results and to help the victim because we don't only want to prevent and to prosecute, but we not only want to prosecute those who are guilty, but we also want to give reparations to the victims. And in this case, in the case of human trafficking, humans and exploitation of children, we immediately realized that exploited teenagers should be immediately paid for their work. And the Ministry of Labor was in charge of that. We also started the prosecution of the guilty parties. And we also immediately returned minors to their family members. In this way, the lesson is that reparations were immediately and measures were taken immediately, which this was possible due to the coordination. This is a very important lesson. Thank you. Thank you, Minister Gloria. Colombia has worked with UNDC, with the United Kingdom, and this shows that the multidimensional nature of this requires solutions and it requires cooperation with multiple uh, partners in other regions of the world. Could you please share your lessons learned in order to obtain successful cooperation? Gracias. Sí, efectivamente, nosotros. Thank you. Y yes, we uh, have been working and we are doing these undertaking these efforts with the institutions that were just uh, mentioned. So for us, international cooperation has been essential in order to uh, provide that uh, technical support and reinforcement. So this really, again, we look at the guide that we are going to publish in order to train inspectors to detect uh, trafficking of persons. They need to be able to identify these uh, cases in order to especially detect uh, forced labor cases because our inspectors usually were not formally trained for these types of activities 
So if as we exchange experiences with Peru, for example, Peru already has a guide, significant one, and we're very thankful that they were able to share that very valuable input. The ILO has also undertaken uh, significant uh, measures in terms of training and articulation of these efforts. And this has also taught us that from the Ministry of Labor, not only do we look at um, inspect, inspection of forced labor cases, but also we see that this is a cross-cutting effort through the mobility office, you have the office on the fundamental rights uh, and guarantees protections, as well as the inspector's uh, office. It, this is essential because you train, you learn to detect instances of forced labor. And it's also important as we articulate our efforts with the uh, private sector, because not every case we find are just um, our forced labor. So we need to be, our inspectors need to know and look, weed out through the nuances. And another effort that I think has been very supportive has been in the area of international efforts has to do with cooperation is working with other agencies that also follow up investigations. You have, for example, the attorney general's office where we maintain significant initiative where they train our inspectors in detecting these cases that are vital. So the idea is that by next year, we'll be able to implement the guidelines and we will have a more encompassing focus and effort in terms of detecting, imposing also penalties and uh, convictions when these inspectors detect trafficking in persons, but also that these people are not receiving payment in their forced labor conditions and all of their other labor rights are violated. So when the Ministry of Labor is informed of this, they right away need to notify the Attorney General's office in order to take the proper actions. When we see children involved or child labor, then you also have the family services agencies involved. One thing that needs to be clear to everyone is that all of the government agencies need to work jointly. We need to clearly articulate our efforts, working in the area of international cooperation, working with our neighboring countries as well, because the effort allows us to reduce significantly cases of, the, of these crimes we can meaningfully eradicate this because one thing that's essential is that we must punish the guilty because as we punish the guilty, we then become, um, we become more uh, resourceful in eliminating this. That's why that's essential in uh, detecting forced labor cases. But one other essential is that we shouldn't just step up the efforts at the national or federal level. We need to also work with the local jurisdictions, with the mayors, and with the public and private sector in partnership. The private sector has been a key stakeholder. Looking at the uh, business associations, for example, more than 40 businesses that are part of that network have signed specific agreements looking at in, in the effort to eliminating child labor. And at the same time, they're able to train their stakeholders, they're able to train the uh, providers. So that way, the uh, actions, joint actions and efforts become much more effective. Thank you. We, ILO we has have been 177 accompanying countries, uh, working with governments inspectors. in 187 countries. Is there a common denominator in order to ensure success in these initiatives with the private sector? Well, I believe that the common denominator would be incentivizing the private sector from the very beginning of the process. So for some processes, we've had quite a significant result over the years for everyone, not only in this region, and all of them have in common the involvement of the private sector from day one. Of course, there are exceptions. The sector has some peculiarities and it is necessary for the sector itself to compose itself, to establish its planning 
And also there is another issue that I want to mention here, which is the production chain. It's very important to remember that when we speak about private sector, we're talking about a huge chain of responsibilities because everything that is being said about trafficking in persons, but also other forced labor situations, all of this comes from situations where you have less supervision from government, more informal work, and sometimes it is the companies themselves that are able to reach those corners. It's part of their chain. So the private sector could also be a supervisor for these processes. So in our region, for example, I could mention a few initiatives. Uh, we have the 8.7 Alliance by ILO, which is a joint effort to accelerate efforts to end the uh, forced labor and child labor up to 2030. We are also involving the private sector in this whole process. And in the region, we also have a few countries that belong to the pioneer country group. For example, we have Chile, Costa Rica, Guatemala, Honduras, Mexico, and Peru. In fact, within the region, these countries also have ILO support to develop their political agendas for 2030. And all of these actions are also developed with the private sector participation. Another significant initiative are the national policy plans. A few of those have already mentioned here. We have many national plans that are important in our region, but the more they are built on a tripartite basis, they will be more effective because this document will reflect the needs and the realities of the sectors involved. And they really need to work jointly in such a way as to eradicate trafficking in people, not only uh, in the region, but worldwide. An important point is that during this process, we have to, we need to pay attention to the non-discrimination principle. In many countries, in Brazil, for example, over 95% of the retrievable people are men. According to ILO's reports, it is 90% women. So where are these women? Maybe our systems are not able to see them. them. Maybe to a number of reasons, reasons that we have been discussing. Maybe even these jobs are jobs that are not seen as jobs like domestic work or sexual work. So these this employment is considered less visible. That's why the weird may be in a more vulnerable position. Thank you. The International Organization of Employers support the business community in their institutional efforts against human trafficking in all world regions. What are, in your opinion, the key factors for the private sector to achieve a successful collaboration on this issue? Thank you. And let me first really underline the need for partnerships, right? Because a company headquartered in New York, headquartered in Paris, London, or Tokyo will not be able alone to eradicate forced labor, to eradicate human trafficking around the supply chain. We need a partnership and everyone needs to um, play its role. And that is a real important point. We have rules and responsibilities, right? We need governments on board to better implement and enforce the applicable laws. Employers federation have a key role to play when it is about awareness raising, when it is about building capacity within the supply chain, when it is about coordinating collective action. Trade units play an important role to inform their workers, to bring grievances to the public if there are problems. And then, of course, you have international organizations like the ILO who play such an important role in helping and supporting their constituents. It is also important in these partnerships to look at the root causes, right? It's not enough just to try to find these victims of human trafficking. We need to avoid a situation that these people even start to put their hands in the, their lives in the hands of trafficker. And I spoke already about the need to have legal pathway for migration. Other root causes are, of course, poverty. 
They need social protection systems, which um, help people in their in their emergency situations, so they don't need to immigrate. We need better labor market outcomes. So there are so many root causes we need to address in order to take away the market for human traffickers. We need more innovative approaches, right? We cannot use again and again and again the same approach and then be surprised that we are not successful. Um, Thais spoke about the Alliance 8.7 and we really believe that it's a very innovative approach to achieve change because what Alliance 8.7 does is to bring together at the international level, the international organizations from the UN, from regional organizations, from NGOs, employers, trade unions, and you have then at national level the same reflected um, at national level with employers, with NGOs, with governments, and connecting the dots from the international to the national level, ensuring that everyone is involved, we really believe you can make a change. And it's also a leadership issue, right? Too often we believe it is delegated to an advisor, to a junior advisor. Yeah, yeah, you deal also with child labor, forced labor and women, right? That is always a package. And that is then given to some junior people in the organization. And of course, nothing will move in there, right? Nothing will move in a partnership and nothing will move um, from the organizational point. You need decision makers. You need someone who can make a decision in these partnerships. And what we are doing at the IOE at the moment is to have a leadership initiative. So we want to move this to the topic for the Secretary General of our organization. So we created the leadership initiative on Alliance 8.7, where we bring in the CEOs, where we bring in the Secretary General to make this their topic. It's not anymore the topic from the junior advisor who works half time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Matthias. Uh, Anna. Uber tiene un largo recorrido de colaboración con múltiples socios en países de dentro y de fuera de América Latina y el Caribe, ¿no? ¿Nos pueden compartir lecciones aprendidas? Can you share lessons learned? What can we do to better cooperate in this area? I think what's essential that we have learned is that we need to have public uh, private partnerships working in unison with civil society in order to have meaningful impacts and in order to move forward each one kn knows what they need to do in their area they understand or they need to understand some of the restrictions and limitations as well as the strengths of partnerships we've seen situations where frequently in the case of the ngos they understand perfectly how to spread the message and share the message with the business community and how to ensure that these actors understand the significance of this initiative and may not have the same impact if I were to convey the message from within. So we need to understand the strengths that each one of the stakeholders has and how we can work jointly and how we're by working jointly, we are going to be more successful in having an impact and the initiatives in the initiatives that we undertake. We also need to understand that within businesses, we have to involve various stakeholders. That's essential. And they that needs to be understood by people who are working together. It's not just one person, one area that makes decisions, but these are projects and initiatives that have an impact in multiple areas and you have to involve all of the pertinent stakeholders and we need to also develop champions within the entrepreneurs so that we can convey the message and convey it to those areas that are making the decisions and that can grow exponentially or at least help these initiatives to grow exponen exponentially find those relevant actors and work jointly so that we can make the most and get the best out of each one of our stakeholders. Thank you, Anna. Is of evidence about what works to inform actions against uh, human trafficking. From this information you have compiled, are there already indications of what we should do or not, right? Uh, to make a greater impact with our efforts. Yes, we're seeing a lot of indications and happy to share some of those. But first, I just wanted to touch on what Thais, Matias, and Anna were saying. We need to focus more on collaboration, partnerships, coordination, 
And the great thing is that technology can help facilitate this. Even today, it's great to see what about 120 participants on this call with simultaneous translation, everyone dialing in from their homes or their offices. That wouldn't have been possible before. Many of us haven't explored the uses of technology in such ways. And I think it's great to see that we can now share those learnings, further collaborate and help build things together, even when we can't be together in person. So that's the first thing. But I'd say in terms of our work at Tech Against Trafficking, we have identified identified about five or six kind of key learnings I'd like to highlight. The first is ongoing technical support. Technology can act as a multiplier effect in terms of organizational impact, but many of the civil society organizations developing and deploying these tools have limited capacity, resources, and personnel, which creates barriers and challenges to taking on and maintaining effective technology and scaling it. We need to be able to help provide ongoing technical support. And that means, again, further collaboration, bringing in those resources, that time, that expertise to help really use these tools effectively. Secondarily, active engagement and participation of those closest to the issue. And this is something that others have brought up as well. But those that are funding, developing, and implementing technology-based solutions should be ensuring that active engagement and participation of vulnerable populations or target groups throughout the design, development, and deployment of such technology solutions. NGOs are already on the front line supporting these populations, victims, survivors of human trafficking, and they're really uniquely well-placed to inform how technology tools are designed and used to be most effective. Victims are the ultimate beneficiaries of all of these interventions in the field, and they should be playing an important role in the development of tools designed to end this problem. And the third, fit for purpose. So this plays in the importance of addressing and understanding various stakeholder groups needs before developing a technology solution for them. Those who are funding, developing and implementing technology, be it law enforcement, government, academics, companies, should ensure that the solutions are fit for purpose and taking into account the issues regarding access, coverage, literacy, organizational resources, and technical infrastructure. I saw a wonderful, beautifully designed app the other day that was intended to raise awareness among migrant populations from South America to, the, to North America in terms of some of the vulnerabilities around um, job opportunities, et cetera. And I think they had a total of about 10 users because they hadn't appropriately consulted the populations they were trying to target and it didn't fit their needs. So even though it was a beautifully designed application that they spent a lot of resources on, it's just not being used. Fourth, that I'd like to really highlight is that there are limits to what technology can do. So our entire collaboration focuses on using technology effectively, but technology can't act as a substitute for the range of other factors needed to effectively combat trafficking, including political will, adequate resources, or a commitment from the wide range of actors with the mandate and competencies to work in this field. The human trafficking value chain needs to be addressed at multiple points, which requires this collaboration we've just been discussing across sectors. And then five, just another, um, I guess, plug to consider the easy solutions. There are a range of tech solutions that are needed in this space, from those using artificial intelligence to facial recognition, but many times WhatsApp, Facebook Messenger, dedicated SMS text channels and platforms allow for communications with victims seeking assistance. And these simple solutions are sometimes what work best. Many of the organizations working on these issues have said that really what they need is the infrastructure that would allow them to use technology effectively. Laptops, stable internet, and the majority of tools are really simple, straightforward technical interventions. And then finally, my last point would be around due diligence, of course, where what we discussed earlier, then perhaps most importantly, the provision of such technologies must be accompanied with training not only on the use of the tool, but on their ethical use in respect to human rights and data protection. Due diligence should be conducted on technologies deployed by all of the actors across the sector, from government, law enforcement, service providers, et cetera, to identify, avoid, address, and mitigate all potential adverse human rights impacts that can arise from the use of these technologies in accordance with the UN guiding principles on business and human rights. And the work that we've done earlier this year with OSCE really highlights the potential for intentional and unintentional misuse of technology. So we'd urge all partners on this call to think through 
the life cycle of the technology and undertake due diligence on the products to ensure that they're being used in the appropriate ways. And then I guess a final plug, just to pull on, I think something Thais was saying earlier, that we can challenge assumptions of what's working and what's not working. I believe she was saying that, you know, sometimes we don't even see where the problem is, that we're focused on the wrong side of the problem. We're not seeing where the women who are being exploited are actually working. We're not identifying them in these situations of exploitation. And so challenging our assumptions, thinking creatively, thinking wrong, I'll put in quotes, which is an exercise we sometimes use to really push the boundaries of our understanding and think of new ways to tackle and address this issue. Thank you very much, Hannah. So, uh, entonces, tenemos una pregunta de la audiencia direccionada. We have a question from the audience for all of the panelists. And the question is, what strategies are being created in the region and even outside of the region in order to also uh, follow money laundering and uh, illegal proceeds that are coming from the human uh, trafficking or trafficking of persons. Anna, would you like to start? Jim? Anna or, or Anna? <laughs> Anna, Anna, go ahead. I'm happy to start. I know of a few that are kicking off within the financial tech space. So we call it fintech. And the fintech space is really considering new ways of using sophisticated technologies such as AI to identify discrepancies in payments. So PayPal, for example, is working with Polaris, um, the US-based anti-trafficking organization to on a new partnership that can help with identification and discrepancies within financial payments and help um, think through where they can provide support. There's also, I believe, the Traffic Analysis Hub, as well as the Red Flag Accelerator out of the UK that have been working with financial institutions to see how they can play a role here. And a lot of that is, I believe, still in the early stages and much of it's confidential. Um, I don't have insight into all of it, but I think those are a couple of great places to start working with the financial institutions, tracking payments, and helping them understand the role that they can play here by coordinating with other actors throughout the system. Thank you. Uh, uh, Thais? Thais? I could mention the network for companies in this topic. This is not part of the ILO mandate. We don't work with them directly, but within the 2017 initiative for the company network, there is an attempt to create an environment in which the companies can act and mitigate risks of forced labor and uh, trafficking in persons. And then we have this issue, which is money laundering and connected crimes that are also connected to uh, trafficking in person. So even though we don't work with these topics directly in this forum, these topics are uh, combined and the companies can discuss not only uh, trafficking in persons, but also other crimes that might be related. Thank you. Matthias? Thank you so much. Yeah, indeed, there are different initiatives that really look and try to take a broader view on um, human rights violations generally and on trafficking and forced labor more specifically. You know, right? you have the UN Working Group on Business and Human Rights who just released a report about the connection between corruption and human rights violations. We from the IE side um, released a guidance for companies actually, how to merge the dots within a company, how to make sure that you work together with compliance when you are a human rights officer or a sustainability officer. Um, we, there are NGOs like for instance, the um, Transnational Alliance for uh, illicit, uh, to combat illicit trade, right? Which is focusing more and more also on human rights violations, which includes of course also um, uh, trafficking and forced labor. So I think there's a growing awareness that we have to look over um, our own topic and engage in different topics in order to make sure that we amplify our work. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Minister Rodriguez. 
Minister Rodriguez. I think we've lost connection to Minister Rodriguez. Yes, thank you. I, I didn't hear you. I couldn't hear you. Well, yes, we, well, all of the organization that have already spoken have reflect an international perspective. We are looking at it from a local perspective and it's really not our area of expertise because we're looking at other crimes. But um, in terms of the labor issues, we are working and coordinating with the, mig the immigration authorities. And we know that there's a lot of uh, illegal immigration people going through the Mexican border. So with regards to immigration, the, uh, the committee working with the immigration authorities, we're looking at how to address and establish the proper contacts. So thanks to this forum, I think we'll be able to take away a lot of uh, new contacts so that we can uh, look at uh, how we can uh, legalize and um, so that, because we know that many of these people who travel are under very precarious conditions and are prone to be exploited. So working, um, and we've worked with uh, the International Migration, the Office of Migrations. We will um, try to ensure that these uh, migrations are legal and uh, structured so that um, we can also repatriate these people uh, safely. So basically, that's all I had to say with regards to that. Thank you. Gloria. Yes, thank you. Just following up of what the minister has said from the Ministry of Labor here, we have established specific policies aimed at um, the migration flows from Venezuela. That's become a very serious issue in Colombia. So we're issuing special permits for the migrants that are coming into work. So we try to legalize their status. And I think this will help to prevent, to a large extent, uh, the um, trafficking in persons. Now, part of our anti-human trafficking efforts include, and we discuss several, we look at many of the issues that we've discussed here, including money laundering that you've pointed out, we've identified guidelines as to how we can address the financial aspects where the uh, traffickers are deriving profits and ex in fact, large profits. But here in the Ministry of Labor, when we look at our jurisdiction and authority, what we're doing is we're trying to legalize the status of these uh, migrants so that they have work permits. And at the same time, we are, we're developing through uh, records. We're creating a database so that uh, we're able to better articulate exactly what we're looking at. And at the regional level, we at the regional level working with the, uh, with the um, International Labor, Labor Organization, the UN, we're working in the um, within the Quito process, where we've developed regional strategies, especially in, as it affects uh, labor issues relating to the regional uh, efforts for providing income sources for the migrants. And when we look at what are the root causes in terms of uh, trafficking of persons, where we have forced labor, as we combat those root causes, then we'll be able to make meaningful strides to reduce the informal labor market. And as we do that, it'll be more and more difficult for, in the case of Colombia, for example, they are given these so-called attractive job offers where they're deceived and exploited. So just as an example with Ecuador, we are working within this socioeconomic integration initiative. We're integrating the public um, job services. So in Colombia, for example, we see the jobs that are available and posted in Ecuador and the same in the other direction. Those workers that want to seek jobs 
in Ecuador or in Colombia, they're going to see whether with if there are jobs available and posted, are they uh, would they be uh, eligible for that? So that's one way that the Ministry of Labor can help actively because it's our obligation in creating these policies that will in turn help to contribute to eradicate the uh, um, trafficking in persons as well as child labor and forced labor. They're all interconnected. And in this regard, I believe that uh, in Colombia, we have con continuous, uh, maintained continuous efforts. One issue that keeps us concerned right now has to do with sexual exploitation of uh, girls, adolescents, and our minister is very, very closely following at these events and uh, is involved in many initiatives with the other authorities. Thank you. Muchas gracias, Gloria. Les cuento y justo eh, en uno de los próximos eventos vamos a tener un panel enteramente dedicado Muchísimas gracias, Dulce, y a Thank todos los participantes so much, que nos han acompañado por all the participants este for having a esta hora. Stay a with us. We have a more than 100 participants at this time. Por último, Thank you so much for your presence. And our last request la, is a request for feedback. Your feedback is very important. Todos to los agradecimientos a las autoridades, a los panelistas, a los colegas, a los organizadores que colaboraron para que este primer diálogo haya sido tan rico en aprendizaje. Sabemos que es un tema muy duro, pero ustedes con su liderazgo y compromiso para erradicarlo han llegado al optimismo. Los invitamos a que estén atentos a nuestras redes sociales para enviarles las fechas y temas específicos de los próximos diálogos. Y con esto vamos por finalizar nuestro primer diálogo virtual de esta casa de personas. En nombre del Instituto Americano de Desarrollo, agradecemos nuevamente su participación. Hasta pronto. Se cuidan mucho. Se los necesitamos. Gracias.